motion to order, please. And okay. I would like to invite Harpreet to come up and, and get us started. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. So we have our last budget work session for FY 2020 today. And the departments are going to be presenting their uh, budget requests, both funded and unfunded. And we'll start with community development. Alice. Hey, good afternoon. Let's start with community development. I don't know how I get so lucky to be first. But <laughs> say I get it over with. Okay, community development. You see, that's you know our uh, mission is to protect the built environment, uh, and take great pride in that, and strive to do that every day. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we have accomplished. We've completed the stormwater uh, review of the stormwater ordinance to make sure that we're staying in compliance with our MS4 permit. We've updated the erosion and sedimentation pollution control ordinance. We did this, a, oh gee, a few months back, I think before the end of the, of the year. Uh, we've completed multiple tax amendments to the Unified Development Code, um, and in particular, as it relates to retaining walls and the installation of sidewalks. The uh, UDC is a living document, so we will continually look to amend it and to make it better and to make it uh, react to development trends as they occur. Uh, the one thing that we really focused on is utilizing our GIS to provide more transparency and more information uh, to the community and also to work with the different departments. Uh, we're working on our PDF maps on the website, so they're more interactive maps. Basically, it used to be if you pulled up a map, it was you couldn't zoom in and zoom out. Now you can zoom in and zoom out and get more detail. Uh, we're looking, working with uh, community relations to uh, reorganize our GIS uh, website and also continue to work with the uh, other city departments on story maps. Good news, the great news for us is that we are redesignated as a planned first community uh, by the <coughs> city. and that's very important because uh, that says that the city takes their comprehensive plan uh, very seriously, not only in developing the plan, but also in implementing the plan. Uh, and this one I have to qualify, we've completed the historic district master plan. <laughs> And we are sure to have that completed before this budget year is complete is is up. Um, and we completed the historic resource inventory survey. One of the things that we are asking for out of this budget is to reorganize the department by restoring building permit and code enforcement back under the city umbrella. Is to no longer have those services uh, contracted. We think that it's time to do that. There was a good reason as to why we outsource, and there's a good reason of why we believe now it's time to bring those services back under the full umbrella of the city. We're always looking to incorporate technology into the permitting process to allow for more uh, submission, auto, uh, electronic sub submission of application. We really want to look and try to focus on plan review, how we can communicate through technology with the various departments on their reviews and the application. We've completed the year three scope of our three-year GIS strategic implementation plan. We'll probably start looking at reevaluating that uh, strategic plan and see how what other things that we need to do. And we, what, I'm sorry, what we expect to accomplish, we also expect to accomplish the update of the city uh, standard construction specification. Again, we want to expand options through, through Munis, working with uh, IT and with Tyler to try and see how we can utilize Munis to, be, to provide more uh, citizen-friendly services so that the citizens can be interact with the, the various uh, divisions via the systems. 
going to initiate the 2040 comprehensive plan update. Now, the plan is not due until 2021, but based on the schedule and the process in which you have to go to update the plan, we have to start it uh, this coming uh, year. We're going to initiate and complete the urban redevelopment plan. That's important. The urban redevelopment plan was first completed in 2010, and there were several updates in 2012 and 2013. That's important because our opportunity zone expires in December of 2020, and what we would have to do is to reapply to be redesignated for the opportunity zone, and we have to have a current urban redevelopment plan. We're, and so that's why we're going to be trying to do both of those concurrently, and we have to be in a position to apply basically a year from now. And through GIS, we're, ex we're expecting to have a 3D model of the historic district that's taken um, a little time there because the staff and the staff with their consultant have to go out and look and at and, and every property that's in the historic district. So we expect this time next year we'll have a 3D model of the historic district. We're looking to implement the historic master plan by adopting the, uh, the plan and adopting text amendments to Unified Development Code to implement the uh, historic master plan. And as a companion to the historic master plan, we're going to adopt a regulatory plan, which is basically a map that I, that identify those historic resources and provide the dimension, some of the dimensional requirements so that when a proposed development comes in, they will have the information there. They don't have to guess and try to figure out what the, uh, the dimensions are so that the uh, new development stays in character with the historic district. We're also uh, looking to facilitate the census to 2020 that's coming up very soon by assisting and creating ways to encourage the community to be counted. That's very important because for every person that is counted on the census in the city of Roswell, that, that means federal dollars and state dollars for the city. Now a little bit about our proposed budget. As you can see on the proposed uh, budget, um, we're asking for roughly $4 million in general fund. That's basically for the operations and staffing of the, the, the department. We're also asking for $750,000 in capital uh, funds. And, and that's amazing to me because we never asked for that much money. <laughs> uh, so our budget is increasing by 14%, but our basically overall operating budget is decreasing by 1.7%. What you're going to see this increase is for staffing is that we're going from 29 positions to 41 positions. And that's basically for the uh, code enforcement and building service, 11 positions, and one on the arborist. When you think about the uh, staff for the department, and basically, Back in 2009, there were 47 positions in the department. And over the course of RIFs, citywide reorganization, outsourcing services, we went down to 2016 to 27 positions. Those numbers have increased because we've added planner, we've added a deputy director, yes, for about three years. I had no deputy director. Uh, and we moved in the stormwater engineer from Public Works where that service was moved to, uh, to uh, community development. So we're now, will be, if the budget is approved as proposed, we'll be at 41 positions. And this is a, another graphic that basically shows the proposed budget. As you can see, the majority of the budget goes toward 73% toward personnel, 11% uh, is operation, and 16% is capital and others. We're still kind of trending down with our budget. I mean, we had a low of 3.8 uh, million in 2016. 
but we're still trending down from 2017 to roughly $4 million as proposed in this year's budget. The pro proposed changes are we're seeking approval for a full-time arborist. One of the biggest complaints of the transportation here about traffic, we hear about trees coming down. And this is not to say that with this position that's going to prevent the people from bringing trees down, but it would give staff the resources to uh, do better with reviews, to do um, better with providing some technical assistance to the uh, residents, and also to do better when it comes to uh, to permitting. Right now we have one person that functions as both the landscape architect and the uh, and the um, arborist. So we really would like for this position basically to be restored because that position is one of those positions that was eliminated with the 2000, I think it was a 2009 budget. And also we're transitioning, uh, as I said, we're bringing building and code enforcement services back into the city. That's actually a cost saving to the, to the city. However, the funding that we propose here is for, trans, for a transition because if they walk out today, we still, we still have to have some staff to provide that services. And we believe by having the transition that will give the uh, city time to fill those positions and that will give them time to exit. Mention the comprehensive plan. We have to update the comprehensive plan 2040. Uh, we're asking for $350,000. Our goal is, because we are a plan first community, is not to do just the run of the mill comprehensive plan. We want to go above and beyond what the state requires. We want to put some elements of master planning into the comprehensive plan. We want to look at target areas and do a lot, a lot more work in terms of what the community wants there and what is viable for the city of Roswell. And also we want to have a more extensive and a more robust uh, public participation uh, process instead of just having a charrette here, a couple of meetings here, and then follow up with an open house and then ask for the plan to be, uh, to be approved. We want it to be clearly vetted. I mentioned the urban redevelopment plan, which we have to update that plan uh, in order to apply for the opportunity zone for 100000 uh, the water resource map is over, I think it's more like 12 or 13 years, and all staff use that map to identify what state waters, streams, and it's, it definitely needs to be updated. So that's 100,000. The historic district property inventory map, that is a companion piece to the historic inventory that was done previously. Uh, basically, we want to have someone, a contractor, a consultant to go in and assist staff with basically cataloging every historic structure. Uh, this is um, labor intensive. You got to be out there every day. You got to look at those properties. You got to do measurements. You have to look at the tax records, and we think that this will assist us <coughs> better in uh, implementing the historic master plan and also in maintaining our historic resources. Unfunded item. The one item that was unfunded was funding for software to enhance <coughs> permitting and uh, plan review. For the most part, our permitting and plan review is done manually. We do have units, we do take in the plans, we do put, the, put everything in the system, but we would like to take that one step forward, up forward <coughs> to allow for the, um, where we can automate plan reviews, where we can provide real-time comments to, uh, to uh, contractors. And we've uh, proposed, and we, and that's unfunded, is $100,000. And I think that's it. Well, can you develop? you have any questions? Council, I have questions. Yeah, we're, is Ryan here? Yes. Um, I guess I don't understand how a comprehensive plan update is capital. Can you help me with that? <laughs> it's not a fixed asset, but um, our practice has been when we have a major one-time 
um, expenditure like that, whether it's like a plan, um, we'll take that out of one-time resources, and we treat it as as if it were capital. Okay, thank you. I, it's the same for the other three together. Yes. I just have a question about the uh, transitioning the building and code enforcement yes. services. Um, is that are they currently operating in the building, or are you going to be moving or adding employees, new new bodies into the building? I guess. Like currently, are they operating from currently, City Hall? Currently, our contractors operating in the building. They do. Okay. Yes. So you're just transitioning them to. We're just City trans Hall. transitioning because their contract expired. Expi well, actually, they they had a a five year contract with annual uh, renewals. <laughs> and both parties have the option of submitting a letter giving 30 day notice that we're not going to extend the contract, which is what we did. So now that come June 30th, they will no longer be obligated to provide that services to the city. But because I've talked to them and we all agree to have a brief transition period, if necessary, uh, then that's why you may see city swapping out of uh, city employee with contract employees. <coughs> okay. But no additional office space is needed. Oh no, no, no. No, we may even have to move some 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 uh, cubes and some things around because we plan to kind of do a little reorganization as or as how we uh, do things and how the others uh, try to get more of the inspectors, <coughs> whether it's engineering or building to be together and to get the code enforcement to uh, also be kind of in that, that area. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I don't, I, I can only see all staff. I don't think we have anyone in the audience uh, that is, is there anyone that would like to comment or ask a question? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Council, for, for having me. This is my uh, first budget presentation, so I, just as I get rolling um, and talk about our department, just want to thank my staff as well as the finance staff and admin staff for um, just teaching me, coaching me through um, kind of how we do budget and do business uh, here in our community. As we start to look at what we've accomplished over the past year, um, we've had a number of accomplishments. Our outdoor tennis and pickleball courts were constructed at the Groveway Community Park. Um, we renovated the Roswell Park Field 5, our batting cage, a new fencing and scoreboard, um, installed a number of trail improvements and trailhead improvements at Roswell Area Park along with a kiosk and new shade structure um, in that space. And the kiosk is an electronic kiosk that kind of plugs people back into our parks facilities, our mapping, as well as our brochure. Um, in addition, we've uh, constructed the final phase, and it's nice to say the final phase. I think we've had one, two, and pre-phase and post-phase and all kinds of phases with um, our River Parks trails. And Mr. Pruitt is here in the audience, who's been really carrying this project for the last 18 years or so, and I want to thank him for um, his work and dedication to this trail project. But we finished uh, Chattahoochee Nature Center down to Willio Park, um, had a great uh, ribbon cutting um, for that phase, and it's truly being used on a daily basis, whether it's, you know, raining and sleeting and almost hailing, people are still out using and exercising and enjoying that space, um, as well as renovations to our Roswell Area Park playground uh, restroom facilities. Um, we've developed a facility condition um, report for our historic assets, which I'll talk about um, as part of some of our recommendations today. Completed Old Mill Park Phase 3 which is the overlook to the boardwalk, another great uh, park and facility that we have to offer to our community. And our cultural services division um, has been collaborating, collaborating with the Arts Fund and working on a number of projects, um, not only with the Art Around, um, but also with our new uh, mailbox and information piece around our um, historic black community um, here in our community as well. So I encourage anybody to uh, find the mailboxes around our community and open those up and discover what's inside. Um, as we look into next year, we're looking to, uh, to complete the landscape installation of the City Hall grounds, and that's been progressing 
um, over the last fall and into the spring. I'd like to finish that project up. Um, the renovation of the Bill Johnson Community Activity Building Lobby. Um, again, one of our older facilities um, and the lobby area when you walk into it um, used to be our old registration area as we've transitioned to online reservations. Um, we want to change kind of how that building functions to be a little bit more welcoming and inviting. Right now you kind of walk in and you're confronted with a big, I don't know, split face block kind of armored office space. Um, we want to open up that building so it's just a little bit more lively and enjoyable for the community. Um, and then our partners with transportation, we're working on the driveway and like to finish that, the driveway connection up um, at, Gro at Groveway Community Park, uh, right behind our new tennis courts and pickleball courts. Um, and that uh, program is currently funded and we look to finish that up here um, right at the turn of the fiscal year. Um, as we look at our continued implementation of the Cultural Arts Master Plan, we're looking at various projects throughout our community, um, not only in our Cultural Arts Center, but also out in our community um, for the various initiatives that were adopted as part of that plan. Um, begin the initial design of the A Sand Company River Park Project um, and evaluate programs and services on a regular basis for all of our community to make sure that we're meeting the recreation and leisure needs. So what that looks like from a financial perspective, um, our general fund revenue um, is pretty close to consistent from this year, from this current cycle into next, um, with some addition of um, some staffing costs, um, but no new staffing positions. Our recreation fund is fairly consistent with just a minor change that relates to staffing costs. Um, our capital projects fund, we'll talk about here just in a moment, um, under a little more detail, we've really focused in on um, recommending projects that are around our existing facilities with the exception of just a couple. And really, how are we managing our deferred maintenance um, and our capital improvements related to our existing facilities? And no real change expected with the Lita Thompson Fund coming into this next year. Uh, as you look at our personnel history, um, we're remaining flat as it compares to this year into next year, and you see some of the changes um, from the last five years as well as how our expenditures uh, stack up in the various categories, primarily personnel um, being the majority along with operating and then some transfers, capital, and other expenditures. Again, some five-year history on the operating in the general fund, um, essentially relatively flat from this year, from last year, or this year to next year. Uh, and then a couple of funded requests, proposed funded requests um, for the general fund. First and foremost is um, funding for the maintenance of the city hall grounds and what we're really looking for is to transition as we've done the improvements on the property transition the maintenance of city hall grounds as well as our police department um, into a contract and so we're requesting the resources to have contract services and to bid a contract for the maintenance of the municipal grounds complex um, we will still continue to have some of our park staff here on site but the lion's share of the work we'd like to transition over to a contract um, so that we're not adding park staff, but we're adding contract staff to maintain those um, new infrastructure and uh, ground improvements that we're making right now. And then additional funding for um, some management contracts for two facilities related to our adult recreation center. This is our elevator facility as well as our pool facility. And what we want to be able to do is have contracts in place that are continuing to monitor those two pieces of infrastructure so that we don't have some of the same issues that we had in this last year where we had some downtime on the elevator as well as with the pool pack and some ongoing maintenance and a maintenance contractor will be there to monitor those facilities, monitor the infrastructure at those two facilities and then recommend repairs uh, to those uh, two pieces of equipment. As we start to look at our funded maintenance capital as proposed, um, again, as I talked about earlier, we're really focused in on our existing facilities. Um, our recreation parks and maintenance program, this is our existing ball fields and soccer fields, things that fall outside of our facilities um, that are covered in other ways from a deferred maintenance perspective. These starts, this is an investment back into our existing facilities. So we do things like all of our pumps for our pool systems, for our splash pads, redo surfacing around our deck facilities in the pools. We have a number of programs related to fencing around our ball fields and soccer fields, athletic field improvements, uh, bleacher replacement and others. Um, just below that, you see our system-wide park improvement or our beautification plan. This element is really focused in on the park assets as it relates to picnic tables, benches, tables, chairs, um, 
trash cans. Um, we've got hundreds of different pieces of equipment that have been in our parks and facilities, some of them several decades and starting to wear out. And so we try to reinvest in those facilities on an ongoing basis to try to beautify um, and bring those parks up to our existing standard. Uh, we really try to allow as best we can the equipment to run its useful life and then replace and repair them. The playground replacement, um, this is a partially funded request that's currently being proposed. Uh, we're looking at combining this with um, $100,000 for our Waller Park facility. We'll talk on the next slide about the Groveway Community Master Plan, which is a master plan that's been, we've been working through our implementation. We'd like to pair those two projects together. And so we've deferred um, our Roswell Area Park um, playground replacement. Um, it can go about another year, six months to a year, based on our current um, assessments of that facility. So we've deferred it one year um, to make some space in the budget. Uh, looking at some trail repair for both the Roswell River Walk and the East Roswell Park. We've heard from our community as people are out walking, especially our asphalt trails, we've got some areas that are in pretty bad disrepair, especially with the last rainy season that we've had in the last winter. We've seen a lot of erosion. We've seen a lot of root expansion with our trees, and that's starting to impact our asphalt system. And so this really speaks to how we can repair those two park facilities um, into this next year and repair the asphalt associated with them. Um, we have identified this as an ongoing uh, project for the next three years and anticipate about $126,000 in total that we'll be looking for based on our assessment over the last couple of months. Um, our athletic field, excuse me, I skipped one, the Historic House Museums, we talked about what we've accomplished. Um, we accomplished um, our assessment of the three house museums in this last year, and what we learned is we have continued deferred maintenance in those facilities. And so as we looked across all three of the facilities, we started to prioritize how, the, how we would recommend investment into those buildings and structures. Um, the $126,000 is both Smith, all three Smith Plantation, Bullock, and Barrington, and the highest need, highest use of that. We've got some roof replacement that we need to do, some painting that we need to do, some decking replacement that we need to do in all three of those facilities. Our athletic field improvement, which is the light pole replacement program, this takes one ball field um, at Roswell North, our field there, and replaces all the poles in that facility. We currently have wooden poles in about 50% of our facilities and it's time to start to replace those wooden poles as they start to degrade and deteriorate into our concrete or metal pole. Uh, and then small equipment replacement program, this is our um, lawnmowers and uh, gators and the other equipment that we use to support our maintenance operations. We essentially use our equipment as long as we possibly can. Um, we start to part it out to repair other equipment and then it gets to the point where it just can't be used anymore and this replaces those equipments. And then the skid steer, um, this skid steer we bought in 1999. Um, it has run its useful life as a piece of equipment and it's time for it to be replaced. And what we do with the, our heavier pieces of equipment is we put the newer piece on our construction crew. They use it essentially every day. And then we push the older equipment out into our parks and facilities where if we have downtime for repair on an older piece of equipment, we can essentially afford the time to do that. Um, this one has just gotten to the point where we're essentially repairing it more than we're using it. And so it's time for it to, to be replaced. Um, as we talked about our one-time funding capital as the proposed budget, um, River, the River Parks Master Plan continues to be our priority, and this is one that's not re related to deferred maintenance, um, but is related to how are we developing our parks into the future. This is specific to Ace Sands. Uh, we'll talk about um, the partial funded note here in the next couple of slides that I'll run through. But really, this is about the design associated with Ace Sand. Um, where are we going to put buildings? How big are the parking lots going to be? Where are the trails going to go? How is it connected to the rest of the River Park system? Um, and how are the buildings and facilities going to be programmed into the future? Our Cultural Arts Center seat replacement. Uh, this is a three-year proposed program in the first of three years. Um, as we heard from the Arts Fund, there is continued value in reinvesting into the Cultural Arts Center. Um, regardless of what we do in the future of expanding visual and performing arts facilities. And so looking at um, cultural arts seat replacement, they've just gotten to the point where they can't be repaired anymore. And so we want to replace the upper deck and then use those uh, existing seats to part out on the lower deck uh, over the next couple of years. Uh, again, some reinvestment into our indoor and outdoor um, security cameras. Uh, and then we'll talk about Mimosa Hall. As we look at Mimosa Hall, we're requesting um, $155,000 to tackle 
health and safety and ADA improvements to the building so that the building can be publicly accessible. This is the next project that we need to do. We've opened the grounds and thank you for everybody that was able to attend. But in order to make the building and transition it from a private residence into a public facility, this is the resources that we've identified to need, for the need to do that. Uh, and then Groveway Community Master Plan was adopted in 2016. Uh, there's a number of recommendations, some old cobble stairs that need to be repaired and replaced. And this is the resource that we would also pair with our playground replacement to continue to implement the goals and objectives of that master plan. And then we have the ADA compliance of our existing facilities. Uh, you'll hear more, I think, about just our ADA facilities and a plan to address some of those into the future. We know that we have some needs related to wheelchair accessibility, sink height um, in our existing facilities that are currently being used by our therapeutic program and also some of our aging population. And so this tackles some of the projects to make sure that we're compliant with the facilities that are being used right now. So we look at the unfunded requests again, $100,000. Um, for the playground replacement, which we um, can defer, we're looking maybe into the mid-year budget or potentially proposed for next year at the Roswell Area Park, and then a portion of that small equipment. Again, what we'll look at is just continuing to part out different pieces of equipment that we currently have in our inventory and extend that useful life for as long as we can. Uh, in addition, the River Parks Master Plan, um, the design element, this $68,000 was specific to a marketing plan associated with not only a sand, but also to the river parks as a whole. And the a sand project needs to come first. We need to have that design piece done so that we can inform what a marketing plan would look like and feel like for the community. And the marketing plan is really designed to give us the vision, not only for our own um, residents, but also to potential other funding sources for what is it that we're trying to accomplish in the master plan and in that economic impact report that the um, council received a couple of weeks ago. And so we can defer this item um, potentially to mid-year into next year and still be able to progress forward on the ASAN project. Um, and we've also, um, the proposed or the unfunded uh, one-time capital of Ros or the East Roswell Park Faust Road Phase 2 improvement plan. As we talked earlier, we transitioned the Phase 1 was our ADA access and our parking lot access into that um, Art Center East. Uh, we can defer this project uh, either in mid-year, potentially in the next year, or sometime into the future. Um, and we tried to piece that together so that each phase would be a standalone project. Um, we have heard from the community. We've made some design changes to the trail system and to some of the screening. So that project is a, essentially a shovel-ready project uh, for when the council decides that it becomes um, a priority to fund in your budget and deliberation processes, and then we can move forward. Uh, this is back to the Recreation Participation Fund and run through that enterprise fund um, and what we've accomplished. Uh, our joint project with uh, Roswell Youth, La La Youth Lacrosse allowed for a new bounce back at Roswell Area Park. Um, Barrington Hall was ranked uh, by a top things to see in Roswell for two consecutive certificates of excellence. New equipment and procedures for pass holders at our pool facilities, and this allows pass holders to get in and out of our facilities much quicker um, so that they're not caught up in the queue lines um, of our facilities. Um, our credit card processing, um, continuing to work um, our security issues and becoming PCI and staying PCI compliant. We've got a number of transactions that are happening online right now. When you look at our first day of registration for summer registration, we did $451,000 of transactions in about 12 hours. And so this is to ensure that we continue to maintain people's information and data appropriately and securely. Um, our free fitness in the park series continues um, and continuing to expand our visual and performing arts there uh, with Glass Kiln, um, with our new blacksmithing shop and some other projects. Um, this is a, continues to be an exciting project of our staff. I want to thank Jessica and Mary, they're not here, but they do just a wonderful job with our adaptive programs and our therapeutic programs. Um, the adaptive friendship camp was moved down to Waller Park, um, 209 registered participants, and that's just one of the many things that we do for um, our varying, varying ability um, community members. And we're also continuing our partnership and looking for ways to partner with surrounding jurisdictions on how we provide resources um, in our therapeutic and adaptive programs uh, in conjunction with our surrounding community. Um, we're implementing what we expect to accomplish, and the pilot program was actually released today. Um, a new online registration system for our racket sports program. This is our tennis and pickleball reservation system. Council and the mayor also authorized this at mid-year. We started that pilot program today with just a couple of small facilities so we can work out the bugs before we transition into our larger facilities. 
giving community members access to our facilities from their desktop so that they can plan and program their recreation um, through our racket sports programs. Um, providing real-time rental information to our community on where they can access certain rental facilities as they're looking at long-term planning. So if you're trying to plan a wedding in our community for six months or 12 months out, having access to that information in real-time um, is of significant benefit. Continuing to provide high-quality programs, and then we're adding the floating obstacle um, to our Roswell Area <coughs> Park pool this year, which we're also excited about. Um, cooperative partnerships with our tennis booster clubs. We've got about 22 booster clubs in the community that partner with us um, on shade structures at our tennis facility at Roswell Area Park. And then um, the large project, which we've talked about before, is the gymnastics uh, facility expansion. And as we talk about fund balance in our recreation participation fund of about $700,000, this is the $500,000 investment that goes into that facility. And that's why we have that fund balance. Um, is to tackle this project in this next year. So we're excited about moving that project forward. Um, just some personnel history, essentially remains flat over the last five years. Uh, proposed budget as it relates to personnel, operating expenditures, um, our recreation participation fund, five-year operating expenditure history, and then a couple of proposed funding requests. Um, our Sunday Pop series with the Atlanta Symphony is um, tackling a couple of different projects, two at the Cultural Arts Center and one free concert, which would be down at Riverside. Um, we propose that these programs will pay for itself through ticket sales and sponsorships, um, and then uh, some small increases in employee salary that's impacting some of the changes there. And with that, I will stop and answer any questions. Council, have any questions? Uh, Jeff, um, <clears throat> Your page 28, um, total positions doesn't change. Is your historic asset manager both in 19 and 20? That's a great question. Ryan, do you know how we transitioned that in, sorry, I'll go back, in the general fund? I know we moved it. Do you know if it's reflected? That was taken care of that mid-year, and so it's reflected in the revised number for 2019. Yeah, even though the person's not here, it's in the, the, it's in the, the plan the count. Yeah. Thank you. A couple of quick questions. The uh, East Roswell Park Phase Two. Mm -hmm. What just? And you can give tell me later. Like what? What was? What's included in that? So it's the front entrance of uh, the Art Center East is Phase mm -hmm. Two. So essentially, if you were to be looking at the building, it's the remodel of the landscaped area where the current parking lot is. Mm -hmm. So we've improved the parking lot um, as you're looking at the building to the left side. That improvement, the asphalt's actually being done this week. Um, and so all of the landscape and the trail extension um, up to the building and into that parking area is considered phase two. Phase three extends the trail and some of the landscaping down Faust Road to the entrance of the park. Okay. Now, the improvements to the dog park and mm -hmm. to some of the other functional working areas, yep. was that in phase one or is that part of phase That two? comes in phase three. It does? Yes, it does. Okay. All right. Um, and then also... Did, was there money set aside from last year for um, seven branches improvements that hasn't been any improvements or, there? Uh, right, right. I think there I'm was looking some at Jeff. There, there was no money. It doesn't sound like it was set aside at seven branches. There was not. And, and, and for, and, I know and there's a there's an ongoing conversation of acquisition of a small piece of property um, and then any improvements, but that has not been done. But, but no improvements. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Anyone in the public that would like to speak? Thank you, Mr. Leatherman. You're welcome. Good to. Here we are. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Next up, Transportation Department. So, in uh, Transportation Department, we focus on the multimodal transportation safety and mobility. Uh, as far as accomplishments go, uh, we are about to finish construction on the Harsh Gravel Green Loop project that goes along Harsh Gravel from King Road to Eatress Road. We started construction on the Rucker Road Complete Street uh, that goes from along Rucker Road from House Road to the city limit. We made significant progress on the environmental document for the historic gateway uh, project. Uh, we submitted the document back in 2016 to GDOT and Federal Highway. 
the same document also includes the Cerauchi River Bicycle Pedestrian Bridge. Uh, we are also about to finish construction on the RRFB and uh, crosswalk, Cross and House Road 140, uh, to connect east and west side of uh, Saddle Creek subdivision. We have also kept public updated on the progress of the TSPLAST uh, projects and spending uh, through our website and uh, public meetings. Uh, we started working on the new bicycle pedestrian master plan. We res resurfaced uh, 4.53 miles of roadway using the local funds. Uh, we also completed various uh, sidewalk and trail uh, projects. That's our uh, resurfacing list, again, using the local <coughs> money, uh, the 4.53 miles. So all the red lines are the ones that got done uh, this year. Oh, this is our sidewalk network uh, as it existed before the beginning of the fiscal year all the red lines are where sidewalks exist the total is 200 miles so in the current fiscal year we added 1.4 miles of sidewalk uh, this does not include any of the complete street projects like the harsh gravel green loop or any sidewalk that put in that got put in as part of the private developments uh, again, this is as our bike facilities that includes bike lanes and uh, bike shoulders as they existed in 2009, so 10 years ago. And this is how it looks now. So I'm just going to flip back and forth a couple of times so you could see how much got added. So we got so much added because it. Uh, so when we do a complete street project, that's when we add bike lanes, but also when we do our resurfacing projects, wherever we get the opportunity, we reduce the lane width from 12 foot to 11 foot to create these uh, bike shoulders. That's why we were able to do so much in 10 years. So uh, what we want to accomplish in the upcoming fiscal year is this replacement of the Vilio Bridge project. This is a, a partnership with the Cobb County and uh, this bridge, when it gets redone, it'll have pedestrian and bicycle accommodations. On the Cobb County side, they have that Low Roswell uh, Complete Street, and on, on the city of Roswell side, our Rex and Parks Department, they recently completed the boardwalk. So this project would connect the Low Roswell Complete Street in Cobb County to the boardwalk parking lot in the city of Roswell. The State Road 9 and Oxbow Road intersection improvement project, this is going out for advertisement for construction in a couple of weeks. So we hope to start construction on this one um, uh, this summer. Uh, we also want to get our transportation department re-accredited in early 2020 uh, through American Public Works Association. And we also hope to get uh, to obtain the approval of the environmental document for the historic gateway and the, the bicycle pedestrian bridge over the Chattahoochee River. We also want to begin construction of the mitigation uh, we promised for the national parks that includes a pedestrian bridge, some trails, and a parking lot. We want to finish construction of the Rucker Road Complete Street uh, project. Uh, and we want to continue coordination with GDOT and MARTA on the Georgia 400 express lanes, transit options, and the Holcomb Bridge Road uh, interchange replacement. For the budget overview, uh, funded requests. So this is the total of the general fund, the capital projects fund, TSPLAST, and impact fees. Uh, the total number of positions, uh, it stays at 65 from the current into the upcoming fiscal year. This is just showing how the positions have uh, gone over the years. This is the expenditure budget total, over 12 million, uh, including the personnel, capital transfers, and the operating. And then this is the five-year history of the expenditure. So under the funded maintenance capital, we've got the citywide road resurfacing and reconstruction. 
Uh, we requested a total of 1.8. Uh, it's listed at two different line items. Here it is listed as over a million. A uh, total uh, that got in is about uh, 1.2 million. We also requested 100,000 for the bridge maintenance. We ask for this every four to five years. This just includes the minor repair and basic maintenance for all our bridges in the city. So under the, the funded list, one-time capital, we've got the Vilio Bridge uh, replacement project. So that's a partnership with uh, Cobb County, with the county's lead. This 1.5 million is our 50% share of the total construction. We also partnered with them for design uh, at 50%. Uh, that, that's already completed. Uh, House Road multi-use path. Uh, design and construction at two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That's a uh, that's a path uh, on one side of House Road that would connect uh, the RRFB and crosswalk we are putting in now at Saddle Creek down to the House Hembry roundabout that got completed a couple years ago. That'll just connect those two, and then the the roundabout is already connects into uh, the Hembry Park and the Alkin. Point Middle School and the Henry Springs Elementary School. Woodstock Road uh, at Highway 92 turn lane. So this is a northbound right turn lane going on Woodstock, wanting to make a right on to 92 to go towards uh, Highway 9. So this has been a need uh, in the previous years as well, but now it becomes a higher need because the Crab Apple Middle School is moving on Woodstock uh, Street. Uh, that school opens to uh, uh, kids in August of 2021. So if we get this money this year for engineering and design, in the next fiscal year we could ask for uh, construction money for that turn lane. The citywide road resurfacing this, the rest of the 1.261,000 is listed uh, here. The sidewalk connectivity. That's also partially funded at uh, $806,000. So we requested a million. The projects under the unfunded requests. Uh, this is remaining of the, uh, of the road resurfacing. We requested 1.8 uh, uh, and got 1.2. So this is the remaining of that. <coughs> And then the unfunded one-time capital list. So this is the first one is the Sun Valley Phase 3, design and uh, engineering. That's the new road connection that connects Highway 9 to House Road with uh, some significant benefits to the congested part of town along House and 9 and uh, Mansell Road. The Riverside Road Complete Street uh, Design and Engineering, uh, that's another of old issues about uh, pedestrians and bicycles, intersection improvements and crossing opportunities uh, along the river corridor. The Pine Grove Magnolia Corridor, again a complete street for concept and study. Uh, again, the Pine Grove Corridor you know, needs pedestrians and bicycle facilities and some intersection improvements. The Sun Valley Drive uh, Phase 2, uh, uh, so this is a partnership with the North Fulton CID. In the current fiscal year, uh, we partnered with them to design the project uh, at the cost of a million bucks. And they paid 75%, the city paid 25 and the design is in progress. So this 3.2 million for right away is the total cost of right away. So if we get into a partnership with them, the North Fulton CAD, they could take on some of that. Would you bring that back potentially mid year? Or, uh, is, or is that way out? Can we hold questions till the end? Thank you. As long as I can remember. Sidewalk connectivity, uh, again, like I said, uh, we requested a million and got uh, 800 under the funded list. So this is the remaining of that. The pole truck and trailer, uh, that's a piece of equipment that gives us the ability to uh, replace poles in an emergency situation. We have the staff capability, but don't have the equipment. The hard scrabble green loop phase two, 
that's kind of an extension of the complete street project we're doing on Harsh Gravel Road from uh, King Road to Highway 92. Uh, and then Kent Road, that's uh, one of the dirt roads we have in the city to pave it. Uh, uh, it's going to cost about $500,000, so that's, that's another <coughs> one of those unfunded uh, requests. Under the TSPLOS funds, the funded requests, we have a Big Creek Parkway construction. Uh, we're allocating a, almost $13 million for that, adding about $2 million to the Oxford Road uh, intersection improvement project and um, adding funding for Highway 9 uh, gateway enhancements, $2 million for that. So that's the total allocation of almost $17 uh, million. So that's all I had on the presentations. Any questions? Council Member Tizer. Thank you so very much. Um, Mohammed, on your on your head count, your people uh, count, um, it's flat, but there's an ad in there somewhere. Do you know what that? Yeah. Is so we added uh, not in the well in the current fiscal year, uh, we added a position which is uh, to man our traffic control center. To, to uh, put an operator there. Okay. So that was added for the current fiscal year. So that number stays in the upcoming fiscal year at 65 employees in the department. Okay, thank you. Um, the Sun Valley 2 uh, right away deferral. Is that timing? Will, are we, are, will we see that mid year? Or is that something that is behind? Or is that just a casualty of. I mean, frankly funding? speaking, it's the cost. <laughs> If you remember when it was presented and we uh, requested the design money, at the time we didn't know it was going to cost so much for right away construction. So during the design phase, of course, that's when you learn more, you know, and, and things are specified. Thank so you. initial estimate of the right away was I think one one point five million. Now it's up to three point two. Construction was like six to eight million. Now it's like over ten million. So it's a very expensive project. And uh, I mean, it's still a need. It would be a great project, but it's just that the cost is so much, uh, we just didn't know where it, to put it. And just to be clear on that one, that's the part that comes out of UPS, the past UPS yes. there, correct? That's yes. not the part. Um, Sun Valley 3 is the yeah, part. Sun Valley 3 is the Highway 9 to House Road right. connection. This Sun Valley 2, all the old Ellis Road extension, is the part that connects our existing Sun Valley 1 to the old Roswell Road in front of the UPS facility. And is, I can't remember, can you refresh my memory on, on Sun Valley 2? Uh, is, is there T spots available for that? Uh, if there's any left. Okay, so it, does, it was on the list. Uh, well, not as a specific project, but remember the Tier 2 and Tier 3 projects, right. they are like just in general complete street projects and roadway improvements and intersection improvements. So if there is money left, it could be one of those projects. Thank you. Councilmember Wilsey. Yes. Um, how does, so the funding with North Fulton CID, do they have money set aside for this project or are they kind of basically waiting for us to initiate, how does how does that process work? I think the way <coughs> it happened last time was the city initiated the request, and uh, that's what they would hope for the city to initiate. And I guess we can initiate those conversations when we have the money. Okay. All right. Um, and then one more question was the funding for the Highway Nine Gateway enhancements. Um, I assume that's money that's just coming in that will be set aside. If yes, that's at all the that's doing. When that is ready to move forward. Exactly. Okay. We've got this almost 17 million is expected uh, to be generated under TSPLOST, and we're just allocating that money where we think we are going to need it in this upcoming fiscal year. Great, thank you. Additional questions from Council? Councilmember Tizer? Yes. Anyone in the audience? Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'll just get started since I'm making some don't know much noise up here. Um, this is for administration, and I want to start off, as the rest of us have, with some of the accomplishments that have gone on during this last year. I'll not read over every one of them that you see on the screens, but I did want to point out a few. The first one, of course, being the um, public record system that we have in place now, the open records request, as you may more generally know it as. That's a, a huge undertaking our clerk's office and many other departments, by the way, of public safety has participated. We have a new system now in place to all that's done electronically. It's online. It's one database. It's very transparent. Citizens can look now and see, kind of track those requests. So we've been very excited. Martin's done a phenomenal job of uh, getting that in place during this last year. Some of the other things, the IT department, of course, has gone through a little bit of a change in leadership. Uh, you know Maurice Price, who has been here as our manager, as our interim director right now. And one of the things he's really moved forward with is customer service and communication. So just to look at some of the training that has gone on during this last year, uh, the phonality training, which is, our, of course, our phone system here, right signature, and now DocuSign. We've gone back to that system. Uh, share file, uh, our email system, our protection system, Boss Desk, which is our uh, help desk. So a lot of training has gone on uh, that has been very successful in trying to do more customer service within our own customers in our offices. And then the audio video system I want to make mention of, we talked about that for quite a long time in the council chambers and in room 220 is now finished as you probably heard me messing up. Um, but that's very important because we can live stream now, we can do a lot better recording than we had just one camera just sitting up there, the, the sound is also much better. So a big accomplishment, big advancement for us. Um, HR has worked to complete the pay analysis and implementation for our sworn officers for the police department and for the Rec and Parks Department, their sworn officers during this last year, uh, which was very important for us to look to stay competitive from a personnel standpoint. Uh, some of the things that we expect to accomplish in FY20, of course, we have an election coming up. So although we don't run the election uh, in the city, we contract that the Fulton County. Our city clerk is very active in the election with all the registration and the, the forms that need to be filled out by candidates. So we always have a lot of activity during that time. We're excited to always provide a good election. And our IT division, of course, is implementing our new server infrastructure during this year. Uh, during this next coming year, that will be all implemented in place, and uh, hopefully we'll be using that and enjoying a much more robust system. Special Events has had their first meeting. That was something that was talked about with the forming the community committee that has been started. We looked at, uh, we look forward to the next year of having those meetings so that uh, the community leaders that we have on that committee can look at our special events, see what's going on, see what might be advantageous for the city to look at during the years to come. HR, uh, not only have they completed during this year the public safety side, the sworn officer side, they are running a full citywide compensation and benefit study during this next year. That is a full study that will look at uh, all of the jobs, job classifications, job descriptions, and pay rating and compensation plan uh, all at the same time. So we'll get into the actual budget overview right now. Our general funds uh, have increased a total of $883,000. $883, Citywide general fund, if you'll see, which is about 8% increase. Citywide general fund, you'll see by about $2.6 million. So before I uh, even go any farther on that, let me tell you we are planning to have the um, uh, employee raise during the next year. And that's the major, uh, major portion of that. That's why it looks like it does for the citywide. But you'll see also that there are several funds come out of the administration department. It's not just an admin general fund. So these are all funds out of the um, admin hotel motel fund increase of about $351,000. You'll see the special events fund uh, that's not really an increase, but it's a new fund of $115,000. That's the fund that was developed so that we can manage those funds coming in and out, particularly for Alive and Roswell. That's the biggest one, although the city does do music on the hill now also that could be a part of that, but that fund was set up specifically so that we can manage that um, event uh, in-house. Group Benefits Fund has an increase of about $216,000. That's mainly for the insurance workers' comp. It's just a $2,000 increase, so it's basically the same. The Grants Fund is the same as last year, $26,000. That's just for our grant contingency fund. Uh, we have several grants right now that are in 
the uh, consideration phase, if we get those, those are very large amounts of grant match contingency that we have budgeted for. This would be just to put some money back if we get all those in. Uh, capital funds decreased by $476,696 and our staffing level uh, is proposed to increase from uh, increase by one proposed from 55 to 56. So you'll see that the personnel history has changed a little over the years, 48 back in 2016, and then 50, 51, 52, and now 53. It looks like there's a little bit of a pattern there of one per year, but it does seem to turn out that way at this point. Uh, our expenditures are much like you've seen with the other departments already. It shows the breakdown of the operating budget, the maintenance capital, and the one time. Uh, but you'll see personnel is usually the largest with operating a very close second, and then our transfers for our capital in and out. And again, here's just our budget over the years. Fairly consistent, uh, very, very modest growth over the years from a 9.3 to 11.2 uh, over a five year span. So we're going to talk a little bit about the, what these, these changes are within the different funds. And the general fund is the first one. These are program changes. Uh, IT division is looking to add hours or people, either one. It's part-time is what we're looking for. So if there's some part-time they currently have now, could do more hours with staying within reason, we can do that, or we need to add some more people. Uh, but they're looking at around $60,000 for that. We're not asking for anything full-time in IT um, yet. And I qualify that with yet, is because during this next year we do intend to do through funds we already have available uh, a full-on IT strategic plan. I don't know what that plan is going to show. I don't want to load up with a bunch of full-time people at this time if it were to show whatever we need. So with that, it's a thirty, it's sixty thousand dollars for part-time help um, for the uh, IT department. Um, we're also looking for a form of managed service. We've talked about this in the past already. We're not going to be replacing our full-time IT director. We are still going to have a full-time IT manager that we have. That may be reclassified to some extent, but not to the full manager, because we're going to be looking at doing some managed services on our systems. And uh, so there's actually a decrease overall of $73,000 as it stands today if we go to a managed service and not refill the IT director position. Court Services is requesting a full-time paralegal. That's the full-time you saw going from 55 to 56 on an earlier slide. There's new requirements that have come out through House Bill 407 on how our courts manage uh, certain cases, certain citations, and it is very uh, labor-intensive, legally labor-intensive, so they're asking for this paralegal not to sit down in the legal department, but courts respond, reports to our legal division mail um, that position will be working with our uh, municipal prosecutor uh, uh, almost entirely just with working through what House Bill 487 has put, 407 has put on them for requirements. Uh, the part-time web administrator that you see on there for 21530 that is not in addition. That is what we currently have today. Uh, for those of you like, that were here last year, you remember uh, in that budget we had a full-time um, uh, administrator for, I'm um, sorry, for the web administrator, we asked for another full time and you said let's do a part time and see whether or not it's needed. It is desperately needed. So what you did was you funded part time and you said hey if we want to keep doing this we'll just look at it again next year. This is just ongoing. I would like you to fund this again for this next year. Um, the position was requested last year at a full time, it's approved to part time and it is something that is needed. This position works very hard every day. And, uh, and that's only going to expand as we continue to work with our web, web presence. So that's $21,500. And then the last slide is an increase for legal services for $100,000. We generally do that in midterm, or we do that at the budget anyway. Uh, we know, mid year of the budget anyway. We never really know uh, what all David hits. There's certain times when our legal has a lot of in house stuff that they work on. There's certain times that, that they go out for outside services. And so they're asking for an increase of $100,000 to cover some of their operating costs for this next year's budget. Uh, the maintenance capital, the IT equipment replacement program is at $25,000. That's come down from 68. Uh, historically, it's always been around $68,000 we've asked for. We have all new servers, all new switches on the fiber ring coming in uh, currently, so we won't need the 68 this next year. However, there is still a need 
if it, if it comes up during the year next year of replacing certain equipment. So this is not planned dollars that we spend, but it's dollars that are there for when something comes up and it needs to be replaced at that time. So that's why we have that account. But 25000 should be fine uh, for that for the next year. And then the facilities, the citywide facilities maintenance program is $1.9 million. That covers 33 buildings. That's a scheduled plan. It's the same business model we're doing now in Rec and Parks also to um, look at all of our facilities and know uh, what needs to be done and when they need to be done. So it seems to be a really good model. We've done it for a number of years, and thank you for um, funding that as you go, as we've gone forward. Then the um, next one is the IT office. I'm sorry, the network access control. I'm sorry, I went too far. Uh, the, no, I didn't. I wasn't going up. Yeah, the next, this one is for um, the classification and comp study of $95,000. This is one-time capital. Uh, the funding for the network ac access control of $69,000. This is something that uh, IT has been looking for. There's a couple of things they want to do uh, as far as upgrades to our system. This being one to better manage the devices that are actually going on to our network. Um, this NAC control can do that. And then IT office furniture and renovation of 25000 That's not just a wish list. That's a plan. We've been remodeling down there, uh, changing up the way that they can do work. We've added another section of uh, office space down there for them to use. This will provide uh, better meeting space, workspace, office space, and storage space. And those will all be identified areas rather than a lot of that just happening on top of the work desk that they're currently working on. So... That furniture is much needed to finish up a project that has been ongoing. General fund unfunded requests, there were a few of those also that we can look at. Um, the first one was a new initiative that the administration department was putting forward for citizen engagement office at about $100,000 uh, for 75% of the year. By the time we, we get the budget approved, we wouldn't be able to do it for 100% of that first year anyway. There's two positions, one full-time and one part-time. And it's mainly an office that's uh, uh, going to be essential for the city's communication and outreach and civic outreach. As time goes on, that seems to be getting a lot more important. Uh, so we've looked at trying to, to do something like that. Some of the responsibilities would be to expand the core community program that we currently do to two years instead of one year uh, to put some, together a city um, speakers bureau so that when people want to hear more of the um, responsibilities and duties of the city. We have a speakers bureau already set up that can go out and make those types of um, meetings, have more of a presence in some of our community uh, programs that we currently have. Next one was a full-time administrative specialist for special events. That was funded at 100%. We can probably fill that pretty quick. Uh, this is to provide administrative and clerical support for special events. As you all know, there's two right now full-time the manager and the coordinator. Um, this, per this particular special events uh, clerk would, would do the administrative clerical support process applications, invoices and permits, uh, coordinate some of the pre and post event meetings that are going on right now. Uh, I know that we're right in the middle of working with the special events committee. So uh, this, I, I, I believe this position is very much needed working with the committee to see just what the other requirements or recommendations might be for special events and as such. It's, it's funded right now and, um, and that's okay. Uh, professional services increase for legal real estate at $15,000. Uh, that's generally been something we've done every few years, but right now on the, on the near horizon, we don't see a lot of those opportunity purchases like we did the last few years of buying a lot of real estate. So we've dropped that down $15,000. And then there was a request that was put in for a second Bike Roswell Festival in the fall of 2019 for $12,000. Again, it's another new initiative we're trying to get uh, get completed, the, the programs that we currently have going on and those absolute needs that need to increase. And with this being a new initiative, it's not funded uh, in this year's budget proposed. <clears throat> so the unfunded one-time capital, there's a few things. The funding for the security lighting out behind City Hall. It is a big expense. It's $120,000. But as we use the back of, the back of City Hall 
uh, more and more for events. At some point, I think we need to address uh, the security lighting out there. Um, there is some cameras that could be involved with that, but we're you know, trying to recommend citizens and people <coughs> use our parking lot, walk across, and come back. So we think the lighting is really important. Um, I will tell you that the lighting plan that we do have out there and ready to go when the time comes has been coordinated with Jay Rising during the rec department because as you just saw what Jeff said, they've been doing a lot of work around here and uh, we don't want to go in and just tear it all up, but at least we know where all of the lighting and cameras would fit in with the type landscaping they have. But it's not funded at this time. City Hall ele elevator renovations is $105,000. And yes, that's a lot of money. And yes, it's cosmetic. Uh, yes, it's really needed, but it's not funded. In this particular budget right now, the wood panels would be changed out, the flooring, the lighting. The brass would be refinished. It wouldn't be totally replaced. It would be refinished. And then there's six elevator fronts, you know. You have to think about those two on each floor that are the fronts of each one you have to look at, too. Uh, that is something that I wanted to let you all know. We've looked at. We know we could use that. We need that. $105,000. I don't know if we get that or not. So, but it was something that was put in uh, to the request. The last thing is LED lighting conversion. I've looked at this. Very excited about it with building operations. Uh, the total plan for all of our buildings, about 20 major buildings in the city, that we can change out these kind of lights, uh, these flat fluorescent lights go with total LEDs now. There's actually new technology that is not heat sensitive like the other ones were. So we believe it's going to be a good program. Uh, at the time of doing the budget, $750,000 all we had to kind of go on. We've been, you know, dealing with them and meeting with them. Uh, I can tell you that out of the 20 buildings, we go from about $9,000 per for a building to about $120,000 for a building. So uh, I think it would be something that would definitely be nice to see maybe coming back to you at the immediate budget uh, if we could do that because, of course, there's a savings that's associated over 10 years. You're talking a million and a half dollars or so uh, of savings over, over a 10-year period if everything works out right. Uh, but it's also $750,000 that you've got to be able to come up with the money right now, which is not that easy to do. So... Um, uh, I, I, do don't, I do want you to know that you'll see some of these again, but I think we'll come back in more of a phase process and see what we can do maybe over the next three to five years, group them together to get about the like amount of money uh, for each one of those. So you'll see more of that coming, but the total program, uh, I realize, is not funded at this point. Just to go over, you know, briefly what you've seen from everybody else on some of our regular event, or funds, again, this special events fund, you know what, what that is. No, no big changes there. Um, the operating is the main expense uh, coming out of that, not the personnel, which is a little different, but uh, this is mainly for doing a particular event, so you've seen that before. Risk management stays the same. We have one person that handles all of our risk management, so with that, operating, again, is a little over a million. Personnel is very small in that, in that particular division in the history over the years. It remains pretty much the same. I think we do a really nice job of managing the risk throughout our city to try to keep it on level. Uh, there is a certain amount of risk. There's about a million two dollar, million two hundred thousand worth of risk in the city anyway. So if we can maintain that and manage that pretty close, I think we do a, a really good job with that. Um, the only thing that you'll see is an increase in the funding due to some premiums uh, from, the, from the risk side. Workers' Compensation Fund is basically the same thing. We have one person, had one person for a long time. Uh, that personnel cost for, for um, of course, for this one because it's dealing with people and employees is rather high based on the operating. Uh, that's the history of it. Again, the last three years remain virtually the same. And the only thing you'll see in there is if we do the salary increase for that particular employee. Group Benefits Fund is next. Uh, one employee also to handle that, to see the, the um, chart for that, for the operating budget and maintenance. Uh, Five-year history of that fund goes up a little, pretty managed over the years, 8.1, uh, 8.1 to 9, 9.2. So that's our group health. That, that's a pretty decent uh, rate right there going up. You know, we're self-insured. What we do in-house now with our wellness program is phenomenal. I know it's very popular 
And, uh, and from what I can see, it, it's really kind of slowed down and just leveled off where we're at with our premiums, and we're pretty happy with that so far. And it's just a salary increase. All right, just a couple in the citywide. Uh, one thing in the citywide that you'll see is, I'm sorry, is the uh, advertising for the census campaign of $5,000. Uh, $5, you heard uh, Alice Wakefield talk about the census coming up. Uh, we want to be able to do some of the advertising. We did a little bit last year with some local events that went on. Uh, the Census Bureau handles the majority of all of that. But for $5,000, there was a couple of things that we wanted to do, so we identified that and put that into the request. And then the last thing was the Americans with Disabilities Act implementation plan. It's a $200,000 plan for a citywide uh, study on our ADA requirements. We've never actually done a plan. The Justice Department um, sends dirty letters about once a year over our transportation department who works through some of the federal funding um, because we do not have a plan. We do not even have an ADA coordinator listed in the city. So every year, they kind of our, our transportation department kind of shows them some things that we've done, and they say, "Okay, but you need a plan. Okay, but you need a plan." We're not just saying, "Okay, we're really serious. You better get a plan." We need a plan. Um, you saw in in um, Jeff Leatherman's report where he's talking about doing some ADA in their buildings. That's how we do things. We find a need and we go out and try to fix this one. Well, there might have been a need right next door to it that we didn't even do anything with or so on. Without a plan, it's just a hit and miss. So for $200,000, it's a one-time item. We get that done. We get the plan. Uh, much like we do the facilities condition assessment, then we can come back and start organizing and figuring out what we need to do have the best way to do it, leverage our money to do light projects together and get the ADA accomplished as we need to. So that's why that one's in there. And I think that's it for um, administration except for questions. Council, have any questions? Go ahead. <clears throat> Mr. Uh, Mr. Fish, thank you uh, very much for the presentation. I just wanted to mention a couple of, or ask one question and mention a couple, one thing. Uh, the audio video equipment that you all put in 220 and chambers yes, sir. Uh, exceeded what I expected. Um, I think we had over a thousand people watch our last regular meeting, um, which you know is 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 an amazing number. Uh, but the professional quality of it, when you look at it, it's as professional as any other government channel uh, that you watch. So I think. Uh, that's something to, to really uh, be proud of from last year. Um, could you provide us, um, and I'm on your page 82, um, citywide general fund, uh, the increase is roughly $2.7 million. Uh, about a million two of that is the, um, the salary increase number. Uh, not here, but if you could provide that to us, uh, what the remainder of that is. Um, I'm kind of trying to figure out the pieces of it and I can't get there so sure. Sure. Council Member Palermo. So uh, great presentation covered a lot of big items. I actually just have some questions on a few of the small items. Sure. Okay. So one is so the elevator, no safety concerns with the renovation request. It's purely cosmetic. Correct. We'll handle those out of the facilities condition assessment. Okay, excellent. So that, anything that's operational, we make sure we take care of that. All right, perfect. Thank you. And then separately, uh, my, my question is regarding the, the events, special events committee that you'd brought up. Yes. When, I had, when I brought that to committee, kind of my, my biggest task and request of them is to look at how can we make uh, events cheaper for organizations and, and easier for organizations. And since it's relevant from a budget impact, my hope is that in the next meeting, they are able to kind of really be thinking about that. And for example, I would be curious to understand the, um, the bike Roswell fall event request that's currently unfunded. I'd be curious to understand that as a, as a sample to understand what goes into those, to those costs of $12,000 and, uh, and how it typically works with, with what the city uh, the city costs versus what organizations pay. Because again, my, my goal is for, for more events, including that Bike Roswell event, so I'd love to use that as just an example so I can learn. So on that Bike Roswell event, yeah. they're, they're more than welcome to do that event. They're asking the city to pay for 
twelve thousand dollars worth that we don't pay for a bed. I understood. Yeah, no, that makes sense. If if you could just get me uh, a breakdown so I can understand what what kind of goes into that total of the twelve thousand dollars. Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you. I, I, through them, I can get that from them. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Michael, thank you for a great presentation covering a lot of ground. Um, my a question on, I guess it's your 87, the citywide facilities maintenance mm -hmm. plan and the $1.9 million. Is all, all of that, I assume, is earmarked already for specific maintenance projects? Absolutely. Those are actually the, the added sum of what we have listed in that program right. this next coming year, less anything that we think may roll over. So as we finish up this year, because all of those dollars are estimates that were done several years ago, well, a few years ago, because we, we renew it about every five years. So those are um, uh, specific items that need to be done that have a dollar amount. We budget for that. Then during the year as we do them, some may be more, some may be less, but usually at the end of the year we roll a little bit over. So whatever the total of the projects was, minus what we roll over is what we ask for in this next budget. So there are specific projects for each one of those. And does each one of those projects have a, I guess, a due by date or must be yes, done by yes. date? Yes, they're done by uh, life cycles for the most part. So we don't keep an asset, we don't get rid of assets before they need to be. Like we don't replace an air conditioner if it's still got 10 years of life left in it just because it's got a bad part. Uh, we replace the part. If it's got a year left in it and there's a major part that replaces, yeah, we're going to go ahead and replace it during that time. But everything has a life cycle. The paint on the walls, the carpet on the floor has a life cycle. So we want to, we want to, we don't want to get rid of it before it's time, but we don't want to hold it after it's time because we want to take care of the buildings. So that's why we have this program and the cycles that they go through and everything is identified by a contractor that does that kind of work. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Council Member Spada. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Michael, for the presentation. On page 92, please. 92. Uh, sorry, 91. There you go. <laughs> so, um, so the first and the third item there. Uh, so, in terms of you know public safety, uh, where people is parking today, and we want to encourage to have more usage of this parking. Where are we in terms of public safety from one to ten today with the lighting? Uh, are we eight, are we five, are we three? So, you know, just to determine the importance of the investment of this uh, security lighting in the parking area. So where are we today on a scale from one to 10 in terms of public safety? What we have, I don't know if I can rate it from a safety standpoint because I'm not, I, I don't know safety. But I'll tell you that we do, we have standard lighting in our parking lot above ground lighting that comes down. We have, as you all have seen, the string light, the lights that go along the walkway that are very specific to the walkway. And then out back, we do have some spaced out lighting, not very much. So the, bit, the back section with, is the darkest area. Uh, the walkway has lighting, but I don't know how popular that lighting is. And then the front parking lot is pretty decent. We need to maybe trim some tree branches back to get it. So I think we go from decent to not so decent to bad. Okay. And the issue is we think there's two parts to this request. One of them is the more we try to get people to park over here and walk over there. It's just not inviting. It's just not bright enough. And I think that adds to the security and safety. The other issue is as we're doing more events back here. Um, in the middle of the summer, we're generally okay. If they don't run too late, we can get out when there might be still a little bit of light. But if we're in the spring and in the fall, like we're just getting into right now, once it gets dark at 8.30 or 9 o'clock, there's still people out there. And when it's dark back there, it's dark. So I think the more we use this area as an event area, uh, which is one of the things we are trying to do, uh, as we use this more, it's going to be more important that we get the lighting back there. I, I, believe, I believe at some point that's going to be done. It's just a matter of when it can be budgeted. And I understand there's priorities that it's up against, so I understand that. But I believe some point we got to get that done. So it's just whenever, whenever we can get that in. Okay, because we want to encourage people to use more 
this area, especially the parking and walk uh, to Canton Street or any yes. place in this area. But at the same time, we don't have, for what I understand, enough lighting that will invite people and feel safe people to walk by to go there. So uh, I, I, I support this item. Uh, I don't know if the rest of the council will support it, but I do support this because I think it's, it's part of the logical approach of getting more usage of the parking and then you need to provide lighting to people feel safe and inviting to walk by the area. It's, so if it's not, it's kind of like it's nonsense. Good, like It's a good project. I, I believe it needs to be done at some point. Okay. Uh, but that's, you know, decisions that have to be made. Yeah, and parking need is today, not tomorrow. Right. I mean, so, okay, and then the third item. Yes. Um, so this is for all 20 buildings? There's 20 buildings that, they, that this company went out and actually did an on-the-ground walking through, looking at every light proposal, yes. Okay, and out of the 20 buildings, there is any building that have most of the usage of power because, you know, it's 24-7 lighting, uh, because well, yeah, we did we did them all. So we did City oh, Hall, which is just general hours, but we did the we did police, so they're there 24 over there. So yes, yeah, some of them would have more than others. But what I was so this is where I'm going. Okay. My point is maybe you know if you can identify where it is the most needed on some of the buildings, maybe we can start a project with those buildings who will immediately save money on the billing. Yes. And the temperature as well, because then, you know, more temperature, especially in the summer, you use more air conditioning. Yes. So, um, so if it's any building that will, you know, makes more sense to start with, yes. will be good to know. So, because maybe, you know, I don't know how council feel, but we can start with this building that will generate more saving by having a higher usage Absolutely. among the 20 buildings. Absolutely. That was some of the comments when the mayor looked at program two said the same thing that she okay. definitely thought maybe from a phased approach. Um, so that's what I'm doing right now is to try to figure out what would logically make the, right, the, the best way to do it, but yet keep in mind, try to level off the, the cost every year too. So I don't do, you know, $100,000 this year and the next year ask for $500,000 and then the last year hundred. dollars I wouldn't try to even it out, but I want to get those buildings that will give us the, the biggest return the quickest over the next 10 years. So I'll definitely look at that. Okay, perfect, well, thanks. And then page 86. The last item, increased yeah. funding for legal services. What is the total budget for legal services? I, I, I'd have to go back and look. I'm so sorry. I can get you okay. that information. I do not have it. Okay. Um. That's it for me. <laughs> Thank you. Additional questions from council? Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak? So it doubles. So we're asking for the same thing, just to replenish it for next year. Yeah, this would be in addition to. So there would be two thousand dollars. Thank you. Thank you. Before we move on to this one. Um, there might, uh, if, if there's any possibility that there could be some sort of uh, grant money or 10-year uh, kind of funding for the LED light program, I think that would be very interesting to know. Yes. Um, you know, if, if we're going to have savings over 10 years and you have to spend the money today, sure. right, I mean, it's, 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 it's mismatched and we'll probably likely never get to the end of it. But if, if there's a way to, uh, you know, to... to match those two streams, sure. it would okay. be, I think, possible to get some of that done. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. We've made it to the halfway point. <laughs> well, hope we're over halfway. <laughs> we're on the second half. This is the downhill slope. You think you can wear us out, do you? Pardon? You think you can wear us out? I... Uh, I'm counting on... We've been saving our questions. ...that Michael may have, and uh, I will begin by just saying... We have four different funds to cover, uh, and that is the water fund, the stormwater fund, the solid waste fund, and the internal service fleet fund. And 
I'm going to go through them very quickly. If I'm going too quickly, please slow me down. But you have a lot of ground to cover, and I want to make sure there's plenty of time for the folks that follow. So um, not a lot of change in water uh, and fleet services. I'll get to those later in the conversation. Stormwater had a little bit of a change. That's primarily a capital change. So when, our, when we updated our master plan, this is largely about 300,000 of additional capital this year. And in solid waste, you'll notice a significant reduction. Um, that is because last year was a significantly large year in solid waste in terms of our overall budget. And this is what I would say is a new normal for the solid waste month. So going through water, I'm going to go through, again, this very quickly and just hit on a couple of high points of what we've accomplished. The um, cul-de-sacs and water line replacement program is continuing as we had planned. Um, in this slide, I just want to mention we are in the process of completing this mixing system for our raw water tank. Uh, it should be done by the end of the year, but that is running a little bit behind uh, schedule due to the availability of aluminum and steel. Um, in terms of what we hope to accomplish, the big item on this slide is the first one, keeping our raw water purchase or our finished water purchases from Fulton County low, and we did um, accomplish that this past year, and we look forward to accomplishing it again. Uh, that saves us money. The last bullet on this slide is really our focus for this year at the water plant, and that's to bring down the cost of water production further through some optimization efforts, uh, particularly with Georgia Power and chemical use. And continuing our line replacement program, which is ongoing um, all the time. So in terms of our funded requests in water, the positions have been relatively stable for some time. The distribution of the expenditures is pretty much the same as usual, about a third across the board uh, between personnel operating and our capital program. The historical numbers here, again, relatively flat. We're bouncing around, but 3.3 on operating fund expenditures. Um, not much new here in terms of program changes, just the salary increase. We're continuing our SCADA communication improvements. This is an upgrade for outdated technology, and we spread it over a couple of years. Part of it's done. We have a few more locations to complete next fiscal year. And with that, I wanted to move on to um, the stormwater fund. Big item here is we completed the master plan this past year. We just briefed you on that uh, a couple of months ago. And that really set the stage for um, really the next phase of our stormwater utility. The um, projects here, you probably remember, Pine Grove and Norcross are the most recent completion. We actually were wrapping up East Valley, even though we did the ribbon cutting in prior fiscal year, there was some punch list, and the contract was finally closed in this fiscal year. That's why that's on the list. The um, stormwater compliance evaluation inspection for our annual report, this, this time of the year, so we're getting ready to prepare and submit that report. It'll be coming to you, Mayor, in June for signature and submittal to the state. The um, activities here are fairly uh, routine. We do have our normal reporting cycle that we're talking about going into right now. Uh, we will be getting a new permit this year, so next year's cycle will be a little bit different in terms of those compliance requirements. The um, green infrastructure and t are probably the two big activities that I want to mention here. Um, just coordinating with all the activity that's going on with transportation is a big part of what we need to do with transportation and the repaving program, which is going on right now. So with that, in terms of the budget requests, you can see staffing's been pretty flat. The last position we added was about when the EPA audit was going on. We added another inspector then. Um, in terms of the distribution, that has stayed relatively stable, although this year we do have a little more money in capital and uh, this year, which we proposed as part of the master plan. 
And again, the overall operating expenditures have been relatively a little bit of increase over time with salaries, um, but for the most part, it's about the same as last year. In terms of the program changes, again, just the salary increase. This is where part of the capital shows up in the master project list. And we went through this. Uh, there's a list of prioritized projects in the master plan. We don't plan on going through them here. They do get reprioritized every time it rains or we inspect something new. So that, la that list is always subject to change. Um, but we uh, do maintain it pretty much week to week and month to month. The excavator that's here is a substantial new piece of capital equipment, but this is what will allow us to install concrete pipe, which is preferred pipe to go in under Roswell Roads, as well as just a much more durable long-term solution. Um, so with that, I want to switch to solid waste fund. And we've done a lot in solid waste, and uh, hopefully the changes are settling down a little bit for most folks. We completed the citywide rollout of the uh, automated collection, a semi-automated collection, and we completed getting all of our trucks equipped with new um, GPS equipment. That was just a technology replacement challenge, but it was completed this the beginning of this fiscal year. Um, again, a couple of other activities. Uh, you may hear a little bit of discussion about bulky trash that was out on a news post today. That has to do with just regular access to our transfer station. We'll also be talking about other opportunities for citizens to get rid of bulky trash over the next uh, several months. In terms of the um, what we're looking to accomplish, Looking at the net savings or cost changes associated with the semi-automated program now that it's out citywide is uh, one of the activities that we have scheduled. The big one, and you're going to hear about this coming up uh, in a briefing next month, is progress on our solid waste master plan update. So Nick has been over there for less than a year, but he's put in a lot of changes, some of which are reflected in this budget, and some of which will be sorted out and brought to you as part of his um, kind of business plan update next month. Uh, and the contracts for yard waste, recycling, and also uh, ultimate disposal of our municipal solid waste are all within our operating budgets. We've had some cost increases with those in the past year, and we will be managing those and trying to manage those costs as best we can going forward. Um, the transfer station has been on our list, and we've talked about it in the past. We will be bringing you, forward, bringing you a concept for how we plan on moving that project through, um, probably touching on it in this briefing next month, and bringing you action items uh, this fiscal year. In terms of the budget requests, um, this, uh, you know, we're happy to see, with Nick over there, we decided to make some changes and reduce the staffing by two in his division this year. Uh, and by outsourcing custodial services, I'll touch on that, you'll see it in the operating requests. The um, overall program funding, I would say the personnel is about the same. Operating went up because of some of those contract renewals for recycling and for disposal. Um, which is a significant portion of our budget. And then uh, our capital program is actually uh, roughly the same I believe this year. And overall, the operating history gives you a little picture. Again, this number, I think, is a good new solid number that will accommodate our um, program going forward. Here's the reduction in force and custodial services. That's two positions uh, that we will not be carrying going forward. The um, maintenance fee, that's a software program, and then the salary increase, which we heard about before. You'll notice the cost of our trucks are going up. That's really not a major cost increase. We are now getting the flipper equipment on new trucks as we purchase them, so that's most of that cost. Uh, there's also a small amount for um, hydraulics. Uh, system and steel increases. And we are adding one piece of equipment at the recycling center, which will allow us to handle styrofoam and handle it without 
chewing up the entire volume of our recycling center site with the styrofoam irritant. Um, with that, I want to switch to fleet services, and this is another area where we've got big changes going on. It doesn't show up in the numbers very much, but um, we'll touch on it. The fleet leasing program is a big deal, and we're working on it right now in terms of getting those um, uh, quotations specified, and finance has been a huge help both in setting up uh, an earlier internal preparatory step for this over the last couple of years and now actually rolling it out um, citywide. So we're excited about that and what that's, mean, that's going to mean for the fleet reliability and uh, the quality of the vehicles that our employees will have and their reliability going forward. Um, the uh, two, but two items I want to touch on here are this daily service report for department liaisons. So we actually have been able to put that out on a daily basis in terms of the progress on repair vehicles. It's a challenge, but I think the liaisons have really appreciated it. They know when their vehicles are done. They know why it's held up if it's being stuck waiting for parts or for out of um, uh, a vendor repair work. The uh, last thing I want to mention is this increased shop capabilities by adding one position. We actually added this position part-time last year, uh, and we'd like to make it full-time this year, so you'll see that in our request. Um, it worked out really well, and we're excited about that moving forward. We have a couple capital requests to um, replace the fueling pumps at Dobbs. They are very dated. Um, and need to be replaced for reliability purposes. And then some heavy equipment that will allow us to work on our heavy trash trucks and fire trucks, basically jacks for those that will allow us to do more work internally and save us some money on outsourced uh, repairs. So in terms of this personnel history, I mentioned this is a one-person increase, but really we did have this person part-time as a customer service writer for part of last year, and it worked out really, really well. The um, budget here is uh, very similar to the budget that you've seen in the past. However, this is now largely our lease payments for the new lease vehicles in 2020. So it's very similar in numbers, but the makeup of it is a little different. And that's why this chart looks so different. So now it's showing up here as the operating costs, as operating cost lease in this particular chart. The change back here was when we went to an internal service fund. This used to be the old staffing level for the garage, and that's pretty much about what it still is. We haven't, except for the one new position we're adding this year. This is when we swept in all of the repair budgets from the other departments, so it was a net zero change of monies moving from the departments into fleet fund. And now this year, we're showing the overall lease budgets. Um, so here's the full-time service writer position. Again, we're uh, excited about that. It's worked out really well, really helping with customer service and our record keeping. The um, uh, $20,000 here is really some floor mats for new lease vehicles, particularly those in high use, heavy use um, sectors, kind of like transportation, and our water folks, uh, these vehicles are going to be resold in five years, and we'd like them to still have floors. So this will allow them to kind of last longer and be a better quality resale vehicle, which will fund back into our um, resale program. And that is pretty much it. The tool replacement program, this has been an ongoing replacement program for maintenance shop tools, and I believe it's almost it. Uh, fuel pumps replacement, I mentioned, really not very expensive and something that's overdue, in my opinion. And then the lifts for the heavy vehicles, that's the most expensive item. And with that, I will answer any questions. Questions from council? Yes. You, you don't have a single unfunded item in your... And that's... You must have, you must have one awesome liaison. <laughs> you must have one awesome council liaison, Ed. To get through all that, I, will. Huh? I do. <laughs> well, that was a loaded question. <laughs> yes. He's not here. You can talk about it. Council Member Zapata. <clears throat> Water fund. You know, since you brought up the study, what was maybe now a couple, uh, 
since you brought up the study probably a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. I've been a, you know, a big advocate for the water line replacement. Mm -hmm. So I see this year is pretty much the same of last year. Maybe, I don't remember, it was even the year before too. And at, at this, you know, level of funding, at some point we say something like, what, 20 years will take to replace everything that uh, need to be replaced. That's approximately correct, if my memory is correct. And I will make a couple of comments. One, I think it's about a 16-year backlog, so we may be down to about 15-year backlog on our galvanized lines and asbestos cement lines, which are our highest priority pile. Um, we are working on them as quickly as we can afford to work on them without taking on debt, uh, without taking on any additional debt. And the one thing that has hurt us this past year is the weather. So the water fund is more weather dependent. The revenues go up and down uh, with irrigation. And at this point, uh, I'm optimistic this year is going to be better than last year. But we'll see how the revenues come in. And we are tracking a month to month. We will increase that and bring you back an increase at mid-year if we can afford to. And I think the chances are good we'll be able to increase that number. It's actually also about the same capital number, but we do have a piece of replacement equipment that's really valuable that we need our valve exercise truck and a, another truck. So there's a, a hundred some thousand that we have to put into rolling stock this year instead of water lines. We will also be applying for CDBG funding and that should help us as well get some additional work done outside of the water fund. Okay, so it's, <clears throat> it's going down for next year budget, 100,000 less for the water line replacement program. Yes, but I forgot one other additional funding source. We've been working with transportation, and as part of our TSLOS program, there are also going to be some water lines that are going to be replaced as part of that as well. So we're actually going to be doing more work, or about the same this year, but it's going to be coming from non-water fund funding sources. Mm. So, you know, again, um, in terms of Capital funding, you know, I think we have to have a deeper discussion of how long we want to take to replace uh, these pipelines. Um, do we want to take another 15 years to do it, or we can find other sources of funding to accelerate the process of replacing the water lines? Um, I don't know if, you know, if this council is ready to have a deeper discussion of options to accelerate this program. Maybe I could just offer that we will work with finance and at least bring you back a, uh, a status and assessment of some of those options. But I think right now our biggest concern is we are not in a very good position to take on debt in the fund because we still have the water fund, the water plant debt. So we'd like to keep it where we're at. And, uh, but we do think we'll be able to ramp this funding up over time through additional funding sources. Maybe we can talk, Ryan, and see if there's anything we can come up with. Okay. okay. Thank you. Additional questions from council? Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak? Thank you, Mr. Skalski. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about the fire department budget. Um, our mission is to protect lives and property of every citizen in Roswell and those who travel through our great city. Uh, first thing we'll talk a little bit about is what we've accomplished. Um, cancer has uh, become the second biggest killer of firefighters now, um, followed by uh, before heart attacks. So we have taken a lot of steps in trying to, uh, we put a cancer policy in place and we've done a lot of initiatives. We uh, now have all of our stations have exhaust systems in them to prevent all the CO from uh, building up in the station as they check their equipment and that type of thing. Uh, on the scene now, firefighters are decon before they leave the scene. We have a hood exchange program, which means it's a hood we wear to protect our face 
uh, in head, uh, that's, that's the biggest part that builds up a lot of the carcinogens that causes the cancer. So the program will allow us to change hoods. They, they give us their hood, we give them a brand new one. And then we go back and of course all that stuff is cleaned and, and decontaminated. Um, so it's really, that's one of our big initiatives we're proud of in making steps and strides to, we hope to add a couple of commercial washing machines to our stations just to help speed up the process of um, getting deconned and getting back in service because most places give firefighters a second set of gear, but you're talking about a half a million dollars versus what we do. So. Uh, we're, I feel we're doing uh, the best possible thing we can for our firefighters with this initiative. The second thing, we talked a little bit about the boat that we uh, purchased last year. We've been training on it. Uh, we have probably 30% uh, of our department trained, so it is in service, and it's, it's just a continuous training. So long process. It's not like just going out and learning how to to operate any type of boat because this is used for swift water rescue and or uh, body recovery. Um, heavy rescue is coming in in May and I, I'm so proud to be getting that piece of equipment. It's a $1.2 million piece of equipment that I'll be asking you uh, uh, a little bit later in the presentation to uh, staff. Um, tell you a little bit about what that truck's going to be doing. Uh, it's going to be staffed with four personnel. Um, these are not just everyday firefighters. These are the elite. These are the ones who has all the specialty training. That truck will respond to any special operations call, whether it be hazmat, swift water rescue, body recovery, uh, high and low angle rescues, trench rescue, confined rescues. Uh, any structure fires that we go on, any wrecks with entrapment, and it'll be used just as a general manpower truck. And it's also, because of their specialty training, will help us in our training division. The next thing that uh, we've uh, accomplished is we've reestablished a relationship with our local schools and we're back in providing uh, fire safety education to the children. In the past, because of the curriculum the schools have and how tight it's been, it's been a challenge to stay in the schools. We were once in, then we were out, and now we're back in. And with the uh, hiring of the uh, assistant fire marshal last year, that just helped us to be able to have enough personnel to do the other jobs and go back into the schools and do fire safety education. Um, we have hired a battalion chief who oversees our special operations, our training division. He's our uh, fire department PIO. He's our department safety officer and anything else I sign him to do. The next one uh, we have already completed. Let me tell you about this. This was as we were going through the budget process uh, because of budget constraints. We um, funded this project out of this year's budget. So that's being funded out of this year's budget. However, our goal is for our fire marshal, our deputy fire marshal, and to have one for all of our assistant fire marshals to share. And what this is. If we're trying to go paperless, that, that's our goal. And these are electronic plan review uh, tables and machines, and which allows us to go paperless and not have the bulky rows of plans. So this is something that we've accomplished, but if at the end of 2020, if we have um, some unfunded money, some money left over, we'll, we will be purchasing one for the assistant fire marshal. Our proposed budget for 2020 is eleven million seven hundred and ninety three thousand dollars, almost one point eight million dollars. This year we're not asking for any um, new uh, full-time personnel. 
Um, as far as our personnel, we've increased it by two. It's been 19 forever. We've increased it by two. Now, that is just full-time personnel. We're a department of about 200. So we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 180 part-time employees, which I always take a second and take a chance to recognize that we are the most experienced fire department in Georgia, if not southeast United States. And we save the citizens of Roswell somewhere between 8 and $10 million a year uh, by doing that. Our total uh, expenditures with operating and capital is, again, $11.793 million. Operating budgets, 11.2. Uh, funded programs. Uh, the, the first one is adding staffing for the heavy rescue truck. So what I'm proposing to do will be add four positions. So we staff 34 people on a day and 34 people at night. So we'll be staffing, the proposed be staffing 38 personnel in a, on a 24-hour basis, which equates to hiring about 30 more part-time employees. But it'll act, it's actually four staffing, adding four additional staffing slots a day. Um, and that's the that's the uh, national standard. We have been in, way behind the national standard for so long. By the time we catch up, the national standard, I'm sure, would have been changed. But um, that's just to, I'm trying now when I hire to make sure I'm trying to meet the national standard. Um, the next one is increase our funding for wrap stick furniture by $3,000. Alpharetta will reimburse us for 50% of that. Our funded maintenance capital is the uh, protect, uh, personal protective equipment, which is our bunker gear, helmets, and uh, that type of thing. This is an ongoing program. Uh, we, uh, we need to stay NFPA compliant, so this is a program we started two years ago and want to continue. The same way with our extrication equipment replacement. Uh, that's a program that we started last year and we would like to continue. That $91,000 will buy one set of uh, Hearst equipment, what, what they call Jaws Alive, and some accessories. I don't ask for much, but what I do ask for is I always commit <laughs> Funded one-time capital, fire station number five remodel. This is where we'll be staff, uh, housing our heavy rescue staffing. Uh, so that'll go from uh, three to four personnel now up to seven or eight in a 24-hour shift. That station was built in 1991, so it's 18 years old. And this, is not, this price is not a total tear everything down Remodel. This is just right now in the bunk rooms. They're open. Got petition walls that are about five foot high, so we need more privacy. So we'll be redoing the total bunk room, the furniture in there. Uh, two of the bathrooms we'll have to do some work in. We're not replacing tile. We're not getting into all that. We'll be cleaning and uh, professionally. And we, we've got two shower pans that'll have to be replaced. So there'll have to be some tile work done in that, uh, bathroom and kitchen countertops, um, the rear the deck that's on the side of the building right now, it's so unsafe that we don't allow anyone out there anymore, so that'll, that'll be part of that re replacement. Fire gear lockers, um, that's, we're adding them to four stations, we just, we're out of space and we just need, uh, more gear lockers at every station. We could probably use more, but we're trying to do it at a yearly pace till we get caught up. Fire station video card access. We are years behind on this. We have one out of our seven stations, we have one that has card access and uh, video cameras. 
And as you, you probably heard six months ago, a year ago, uh, firefighters were being hit. We were hit here in Roswell as far as our cars broken into and uh, stuff stolen out of that. And it's just it's a security and safety issue. So uh, we're asking for card access and video access. Right now, if I terminate someone or someone just leaves, um, they have a key. So we make them return that key in, but you and I would know that keys can be made and so people have access. If we had uh, card access only, we could simply cut off their card and then they would not be able to get into the stations. Turnout gear, extractors, that's the washing machines I was telling you about for the cancer initiatives. Um, we hope to, with that price, we'll be able to buy two more extractors. Thermal imaging cameras. Uh, for $36,000, we hope to buy six of them. That is one of the most important pieces of equipment uh, that we can use in firefighting. That basically, it can lo locate hidden fire when inside a building. Uh, it can locate uh, personnel down uh, inside a building. So that's a really uh, one of the most important pieces of equipment that we can have in doing our duty. talk just a little bit about the uh, unfunded request that we have. When I first took over as fire chief, one of the biggest things I did was start a community risk reduction division. And you all hear me talk about it all the time uh, because I'm so proud of it. We like to get out into the community um, and teach and be seen. And, and, and so the two up there, the fire safety education Fire extinguishers and the, the safety town, both of them are unfunded. Safety town, we did year for years ago. We did it at recreation parks off, off of Henry uh, uh, Park. Uh, that was probably one of the best programs that we did as, as a city. The problem is it became so logistically a nightmare that, that we just could not do it anymore. But the uh, safety town will do is it, it's portable so we take it to schools instead of schools having to come to us and worry about busing their children and that type of thing so uh, that's unfunded you'll see that again next year uh, the fire extinguisher simulator um, without it we'll still do fire extinguisher classes it's just the old way where we have the pan the diesel fuel and actually fire extinguisher so it's, it's just a just a big mess to have to do it that way. And in Station 2 land replacement, a uh, million dollars, uh, that's unfunded. That's not to say that I don't need it. We, um, I need three stations in the next five years, but um, that's a talk for another day. Um, but we have to, Station 2 cannot be rebuilt on the land, and the lot is just not big enough, so we have got to find some land or by the time we build station two there won't be any or it be so will be so expensive. So I'm gonna keep looking, but it's just unfunded for this year. Any questions for me? Does council have any questions? Yes. yes ma'am. Thank you, Ricky, for this presentation and for all the work you guys you and your guys do every day. Um and women. Um, quick question, can you just give us a quick update on the uh, fire station at Mountain Park? Yeah. The project, uh, right, with the, uh, uh, the uh, Mountain Park property. At right, Thompson. The property in the right now we have people um, that are looking to with a, at a footprint and to making sure a station is built. As soon as that's done, I'll bring that back to you and, and just know that I'll be asking for design money at that point. My goal since this, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I had the fire station in this budget, and we moved it to 2021. Uh, so what that, what I'm going to be asking for is to have design money. It's already budgeted for. We've already, it's already been approved right. several years ago. So I would love to have a design done, and uh, when 2021 rolls around, be able to have you something in concrete and, and move forward with the fire station. Right now, with that, uh, without that fire station out there, 
Uh, we, our average response times in that area are about three minutes uh, higher than any other part of the city. Uh, and also that fire station, every time ISO has come to visit us, uh, they have said that we need a fire station, a ladder truck, and so on and so forth out in that area. So uh, that lot we're looking at is not the best lot in the world. And when I come back to you, I have a, a site plan, uh, plan and, and an estimated price for the site work. Um, but it's part of the, the city property. You know, it, it's part of the Rec and Parks. And I've worked with Rec and Parks um, two years ago and, and, and talked about being able to use that uh, property, and they, they agreed to that. So um, that's where it stands now. Council Member Zapata. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Chief, for the presentation. Page number 170. There, there you go. Perfect. Yes, right there. <laughs> this one. <laughs> the first one. Who are we targeting for the fire safety education? Schools School, only? Yes, School only? Yes, sir. Is any chance that Fulton County... You're talking about the, fi the, the, the first the item. The, fir the fire safety education safety town village. Yes, yes, that, it would be... Only school, exclusive school. So is there any way that we can, you know, partner with Fulton schools to finance part of this project since they're going to be the primary uh, users of that's, this? That's, a, that's absolutely something I can look in. I will okay. tell you that we have difficulty with them now even getting into do programs because their curriculum is so full that they basically work us in, and, and so we've worked back into the program, but I'll, I will be glad to check on that. Yes, sir. Yeah, you know, if we can split the cost and they can help because it's going to be beneficial for the schools. So, and then on uh, page 173, the video card access how much of the 212,358 will be video and how much will be hard access? Do you uh, have this open? I, between the no, sir. I'll have to. That was just a price when we met with, um, I think it's the same users that, that uh, City Hall uses. That, I can, I'll get the breakdown for you. Okay. But uh, that's, um, that was just one price that they give us. So I'll get the breakdown on that. Great, thank you. And then, I don't know if I saw in the presentation, what is the status of the simulator, the fire simulator that we were repairing? Are we done with the fire simulator? We are. I'm happy to report as of last week, the, um, the team up there accepted the work and it's finally done. It, it didn't take us two and a half years. So. <laughs> Okay, great. So it's, it's up and running now? Yes. Great. Yes, Thank you. Yes, sir. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak? Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? I have a loud voice, so I just want to make sure. Um, Sorry, my glasses on. Okay, the Roswell Police Department uh, vows to protect life and property, preserve the peace, and strives to prevent crime, fear, and disorder in the city of Roswell in partnership with all those who live and work and travel throughout our city. As, a city. as the city of Roswell continues to grow, so does the need for law enforcement services. Therefore, our department requests it, you know, is directly uh, related to providing those services to our community and our collaborative partners. This is our new motto. Just wanted to put this one up. We uh, put it out there. Actually, an officer, uh, we had officers uh, come up with it, and an officer selected it. So this is now in all our documents. Um, what we have uh, accomplished this past year, we've purchased equipment and software to improve delivery of our services. Um, uh, one of the equipment that we purchased was a CDR for traffic division. Uh, the CDR is a crash uh, data retrieval device. It's basically a, 
black box, you know, and um, so what it could do is it could pull data from the vehicles to help us better with our investigation. Um, we also enhanced our um, recruiting by engaging in more frequent applicant testing and expanding our outreach to new recruiting areas. It's no secret across the country. Uh, every law enforcement agency is down and needing personnel. We no longer have individuals who want to come into this line of work. So we used to uh, provide this. We used to do testing every three weeks. Now we do it every month. So we're trying to get more applicants and more recruits in and hire more officers. Uh, finishing construction of the new CSI lab uh, and special investigations area. I invite all of you to go across the street and take a look where we're at with that and continuing our command college program. And the purpose of, in case you don't know, the purpose of our command college program is succession planning and to develop our leadership for tomorrow's leaders. <coughs> Budget overview, 220, this is the proposed funding. Um, the total funding is approximately $23 million that we're asking for the proposed. Uh, as you can see in the general fund, it's 20000 It's up uh, a little over a million. The 911 is actually down at $2,770,000. And uh, confiscated assets is actually down 47% as opposed to last year. Last year, we had a lot of large purchases through this, this fund. This year, not so much. Not so much. That's normally the average, 232 million is the average uh, that we normally spend. Last year just happened to be unusual. Uh, total positions uh, proposed uh, is two new ones, uh, looking at 206. If you look at the last three years, it's pretty, been pretty consistent with our personnel. Again, I go back to the times. People, it's either attrition with retirement or people just don't want to get into this field, and that's where we're at. But um, yeah. I'll get this later. Uh, expenditure budgets. Total expenditure is $20 million. Some change. I'll just say change. Um, personnel. Capital transfers out and others. Self-explanatory. Five-year operating expenditure history. As you can see, the proposed is up $20 million from last uh, budget year. It's pretty consistent. Funded programs. Um, funded programs increase ammunition. Funding for ammunition, which is another $25,000. That, that ammunition mostly goes to SWAT and some on-duty ammunition. This is due to increased training. State law requires that all officers qualify once a year. Uh, that's the bare minimum. And it, across the country of all law enforcement states uh, and the bare minimums, Georgia's at the bottom. Uh, we want to up that. We want to protect that the city liability-wise. So we require our officers to qualify every two years. It is my goal to have the officers qualify quarterly, but that it all comes with funding. You know, you have to buy bullets to, and you have to rent the, the location in order for all officers to qualify. But I like to get to that point because that's a liability saving issue. I mean, you can't have an officer qualify once a year, and if they get into a shooting and we go to court, we'll have to justify that. You know, we have to think smarter and protect ourselves. Additional one part-time evidence, uh, evidence and property technician at 100%. Uh, evidence and property is to help increase with the uh, increased demand on physical and digital evidence management. And then, I'm sorry, and then increase funding for uniforms, oh, natural wear and tear of uniforms. Fund and maintenance capital. We only had uh, one this year is the tactical vest and helmet replacement. <clears throat> this is for SWAT and SIS. These replacements, when you deal with tactical vests, helmets, or our or, or, or regular vests, and even tasers, they all have a life of five years. So you're going to see this request fluctuate over the each budget cycle because. Next year, we may have a, a, bu a bulk load that are due. 
you know, so this is where we're at this year. But these, all this equipment only have a lifespan of five years. And so you, just to reiterate, this doll will vary year to year regarding this issue. Unfunded requests. Uh, we had requested two additional part-time administrative specialists uh, for 100% funding for our open records requests. This is a, it's, it's unfunded, but this is a high demand uh, for open records requests. We are struggling to stay in compliance with law. I mean, ever since, I mean, we could ask, we can all turn around and talk with Marley. I mean, we are struggling. Law is very specific, and we will be fined, and we are struggling. And those fines are steep. And so um, it all came about last year with all the uh, incidents involving the Roswell Police Department and the media. And, every, and, and it's basically as well as very liberal open records request law on the state of Georgia. Anyone can ask for anything, and we have to provide it to them within three days, or a request, or a reason why we can't give them in three days. Is that correct, Marley? I mean, it's so liberal. I mean, you can ask for something, you can ask for something, your neighbor. I mean, anyone, we get requests from out of state just because they saw something on YouTube or they saw something in the news regarding one of our incidents. And we have to send them everything, whether it's audio, video, reports. I mean, we're, being, we're just being inundated with this type of, these type of requests. But it was unfunded. But this is the reason why we requested this. Police Department 911 Fund, it's our mission for the Police Department to, s to serve as a critical and vital link between the citizens of Roswell and the public safety agencies that serve them. As you know, we serve also the Fire Department, uh, our 911 Center. Uh, what I am proud of our 911 Center. We have one of the best 911 Centers around, and I'm not saying it because I'm the interim chief or I'm, I'm a member of the Police Department. I'm saying it because it's fact. Uh, we filled it over, well, there's... 150,000 emergency, non-emergency calls, 91% of them were received and answered in less than 10 seconds. That's phenomenal. Uh, we achieved the status of accredited, accredited center of excellence for the police priority dispatch system. We are the 17th ACE center in the world and the only second one in the state of Georgia. That says something about our 911 center. We are hard and none. Maintain a quality assurance program for all personnel to include case reviews, continue dispatch education, and performing and reporting achieve protocol compliance an exceptional of 96% in all three disciplines. And this quality assurance, I used to get, as the commander of internal affairs, I would get complaints. Uh, someone dropped a call or someone did this. Now we have supervisors actually doing quality assurance review on all calls, and it's at random. And they pick up things, and we, do, we learn a lot, and we train, and we provide additional training to our dispatch. Develop and implement a 911 peer support and training in order to optimize mental health, morale, and performance of dispatchers in the 911 center. When I go, or Ricky responds to a call, and whether it's a death investigation, a child uh, in a traffic accident, whatever the case may be, we're there, we handle the call, we see the ambulance take that person away. They have no closure. They're on the other end of the radio. So that stress is still with them. So this, this particular peer support program is vital. So, and we're one of the few first around to help these people. Our 911, one of our consoles, be a dispatcher. You have to be at one, two, three, four, five, six consoles, and plus we're an A center. So try doing that. Listen to emergency call, not knowing how it ends. I mean, the stress is, is is ridiculous. I couldn't do it. God bless them. What we expect to accomplish is develop and implement a full interoperable communication plan with our surrounding jurisdictions, improve and maintain our quality assurance for police, fire, and medical to achieve the ACE accreditation and EMD and EFD. This is another accreditation we're trying to achieve. Uh, achieve uh, APCO Project 33 certification training, maintain our CLE accreditation. Uh, they became CLE our 911 center became CLIA certified for the first time this past year. 
The Roswell Police Department has been CLIA certified since 1994, and last year we received, the De police department received the accreditation gold standard with excellence. And, and that's one of the top awards you can get. Uh, maintain the ACE police status and, the, and of course the design plans which was already pre-approved for the new 911 center. We had approved funding for that. Five-year personnel, five-year personnel history of 911 as you can see. It's pretty consistent. Um, my notes here, sorry. As Roswell continues to grow, of course we need additional people. Uh, total expenditures, I don't think I need to read you numbers. Five-year operating expenditure for 911 fund, 2.8 million. It was basically the same as last year, a little bit more over just uh, than the year prior. Uh, funded programs. There was an internal work uh, study history done. I want to say a couple of years ago, two years ago, and that uh, work study revealed that the Roswell. 911 center needed 12 dispatchers to effectively handle all the calls and within the time needed. Uh, we, request, we requested four, we got two. Uh, that will, the two will bring us to 10. We're gonna ask for the additional two the next time around. Um, but we still need four, but we're willing to ask for the next two. And of course the salary increase of 3% was already there. and the unfunded request. Basically what I said, the two unfunded, uh, the unfunded request was the two full-time 911 communication at 100%. We're gonna ask that next year, and at which time we'll be fully staffed. Confiscated assets fund. Accomplished. We participated both in uh, DEA and High Intensity Drug Trafficking HIDA Task Forces. We have three officers. We have one officer assigned as a DEA agent and two in HIDA. Actually, we have one opening because one of our HIDA, uh, one of our HIDA officers got picked up and uh, got selected by the DEA, so she's out of state. So we're down one. Um, so we'll be looking to fill that spot. And the reason why we fill that spot is the money we receive is based on the work they do. So if we only have one individual assigned to that, I mean, it's like a piece of the pie when they go and they do a buy or a deal and they get millions of dollars out of this, concentrate millions of dollars from drugs, we only get based on what we put in. So that's why our fund is normally big. Targeted specific crimes in high criminal activity areas with added patrols and surveillance. Uh, CSU which is now, I had to combine them because we're so short-staffed, they're just an SIS unit. We use them as director patrols, and we pro, um, they basically handle problem of the hour things. If we have a drug activity focus here, we will send them there, and, and we will flush out that system because our patrol officers are handling radio calls, basic calls everywhere else, so we have them direct the patrol. Uh, detect, investigate, and prosecute those who violate the laws regarding illegal narcotics production, Manufacturing, distribution, and transportation itself, chronic and illegal drug use. And yes, it is here in Roswell. Continue to participate in DEA, HIDA, uh, for obvious reasons. Continue to target specific crime and high criminal activity um, areas with added patrol and surveillance, and continue with detecting, investigating, prosecuting those who violate all those. So, in 218, this was the uh, operating expenditure. This is the normal operating expenditure for complicated assets. It's normally 232 versus the 439. That was unusual. Uh, funded programs out of this is added, funded, added funding for Pickens Range. So this is for our officers qualifying. This is also for SWAT training. We use long rifles. We use handgun. So we use their range in the cost of $5,000. That is actually not a reoccurring cost. This is 
something that we're going to put in the budget next year, you cannot use confiscated assets for reoccurring costs. That is a law. That is not a rule. That's a, I mean, that's not a guideline. That's a law. So we're doing it one time out of this fund to assist in balancing the budget this year. But normally we cannot use it for that if it's a reoccurring, but we can do it one time. So this 5000 will be coming out of that fund. Oops, sorry. And that's all I have. Council, have any questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, thanks for the presentation, very clear. Uh, page 188, please. I'm not sure which one I, 188 is, so you tell me to stop? Yeah, right at the bottom. Oh, there it is. I see it at the bottom. Yeah. I'm sorry. say that freedom is not free, and I can always continue saying that open, transparent government is not free neither. So, um, you know, if we are taking longer than the three days required, uh, or we cannot answer on time all the requests, then uh, there's a problem. There's a problem. If we cannot comply with the law in, in the, and the request that we receive, so we have to do something. We are so struggling. We are struggling. We are complying with them, but we are struggling. So, the, so what that means is other areas where these individuals normally work are suffering. So, well, you know, it's like a domino effect. It is. You know, if you take one thing from one pocket to put another one, still you didn't fill both We're pockets. We're robbing Peter to pay Paul. Right. And at the end of the day, it's got, the bill's going to come due. So. Um, it's not a matter of if, it's when. Right, so I don't know if we need to contemplate and see where these people who is feeling this, where they're coming from, what duties are not doing because they're doing this now. Uh, I don't know if you, you know, can explain where these people, which areas are coming from that they're not doing their job in this because they have to do the open record request to understand better but the whole picture. But there's duties throughout the department. Uh, we're just pulling them from there when it, when it's needed. I mean, so right now we do have the record staff who will process the open records request, but then when we get those influx, you know, we have to pull other people from other positions to our other, you know, positions within the department, their jobs to do the, to work on this. Hmm. And Marley can attest to that. <laughs> so, you know, to have a big picture, this mayor and council, like the situation, what's going on with this? Because when, when we get complaints because, because of open records requests, we get them on time. We get them there. So I don't want you to think that we don't get them, but it's due to a sacrifice. But when, but if they don't get them when the time they think, they'll complain to Marley. Mm. It sounds like it's an issue of staffing to the peak. It is staff. To the, to the peak. It is. Right? Which is always hard to do because you don't know when the peak's going to come. Exactly. Council Member Willsey. Uh, yes, yeah, so thank you, Chief, for the presentation. But just continuing on the thought here, I mean, is that something that we need to look at, you know, holistically? I mean, I think from Marley's standpoint, from, you know, where does she need help as where as you do um, to manage the open records request and how we might just make sure that citywide we've got the resources available. Gary, I mean, just, just a thought looking at the budget, at the budget big picture. Um. I guess I'm not following your question. Are you saying we should look at this holistically, like as far well, as just like finding, well, yes. I mean, kind of finding out where Marley's needs are, and you know, yeah, and we're we're constantly talking about that and, right, and checking right. it every every chance we can. And it's been a topic of discussion since I've been right, here. Right. Well, the, well, the issue with that is police department records are at police department. Sure. You know, so Marley doesn't know how to pull uh, an L3 camera. Marley doesn't know how to pull and redact an L3 camera or a body camera or a, right, a right, case sure. file. Sure. So, sure. And right. she doesn't know what information can be released and what can cannot. She doesn't know what's going on, what's, right. in, the, what's in the courts, and what's not in the courts. Right. So there's so many factors when you're looking at an open records request from a police department. There's body cameras. I mean, and that's, you have to send body cameras, video, audio, reports. 
unless it's under investigation, and if there's a pending investigation, then it's basically, it's a standby. Right. Yeah. We need to find a way to, to scale. Yeah, sure. No, I mean, I recognize there's a specialized need for the police department, but just kind of looking at citywide, you know, what, what the need is and how can we address it. And these two part-time positions will be inside the police department? Yes. And how many do you have today allocated to this job? Well, we have a records unit. Okay. So we have four. Well, it's not to this job. It's who's ever available gets to this job. So do you we have anybody? Have one, we have one person who's allocated, but that one person normally gets inundated, so they, the others stop what they're doing and they assist. Okay. Okay. So maybe you know, we can elaborate more as we keep talking about the budget, okay. about this item. I will appreciate it. Sure. So the other one is page 194. Sorry, 193, 193. Um, out of the 20... I'm sorry. So, Some of my pages have notes. Sorry. Okay. So, can you explain more a little bit this slide? The 29... This is the number of personnel we currently have. No, this is the proposed that we would have with the extra two. So right now we're at 27, but this is the proposed with the extra two. But this is not, this is officer and everybody in the force? No, this no. is the 911. This is, we also have a GCIC person who handles all the GCIC. We have a training officer. We have supervisors so that we have those individuals. Okay. And then the director doesn't count and the assistant director doesn't count as a 911 operator. Okay. Councilmember Tyson. Yeah, I think this is. Just correct me if I'm wrong. This is you, the two there. You're trying to get to 12. Yes. You're asking for two to get to 10, and then two yes. next year to yes. get to 12. Yes. And so that's the difference between 27 right. and 29. Yes. Our two communication yes. officers. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And 198, please. So we had asked for four to bring us up to full complement. So two were unfunded, and then two were funded uh, to be added in October. To, the, to be added in October. So. Um, so what will what will happen without having those two new full time communication officers? Well, it just doesn't bring us up to um, the twelve that is recommended in the case study. Okay. I, you know. We did a workload study, and it to officially run it, you know, the way it should be, we need 12 dispatchers. Um, we're finally at full complement, what's there now. Uh, we are fully staffed there now with the personnel we have, but we actually need, so we have uh, eight, currently we have eight, and we're fully staffed with eight. Um, we proposed four more to bring us to the 12. Uh, they gave us two and defunded two. So this will be... That would give us full complement. Having 12 will either give us more, better mm -hmm. service or less stress or workload yes. to every single every one single at, yes. on the already very stressful job. Yes. So how strong do you feel that we need to have 12 right now to either provide better service or, you know, take some load from the existing communication officer and uh, reduce the stress. Imperative. For me, it's imperative. Okay. And the efficiency of running our public safety and our fire safety and our medical safety. I mean, it's imperative. Okay. Good. Thank you. <clears throat> Additional questions? Anyone in the audience? Thank you, Chief. Thank you.
turn. So we saved the most exciting department for last. <laughs> You're all still here, so it must be true. So, so I wanted to start uh, by talking about what we've accomplished uh, this year. Uh, first, um, as you saw a couple months ago when we presented the fiscal year 2008 uh, comprehensive annual financial report, um, we completed that um, on time this year. And um, as you might remember uh, from our outside auditors, we did receive an unmodified or a clean opinion on our financial statements. Uh, we also successfully completed our annual property tax billing. Um, that's despite the challenges that we face with um, a uh, Fulton County Digest that was delayed and is still not approved, but we're billing based on a temporary collection order. Um, so our staff did a great job of turning that around and getting it out uh, to our residents on time. Um, the other thing I want to mention was the fact that we've opened up an online portal um, for businesses in the community to more easily uh, remit their excise taxes to the city. Uh, so prior to this, they were either coming in person with a piece of paper, um, or mailing it in or emailing something in, uh, but now they can actually go to this online portal, they can uh, complete their documentation online um, and actually submit their payment online as well. We're getting a lot of uh, usage out of that. That's for our car rental excise taxes, hotel motel taxes, and our um, alcohol taxes. Other things we also accomplished um, include, uh, the first, for the first time, we completed a budget and brief uh, document working with community relations. Um, this was really an effort to take the highlights from our approved budget um, into something that's more easily read. Uh, this was uh, designed by community relations and was included um, in a utility bill um, after the budget was approved and sent out to our residents. So they had, could have a basic understanding of what was in the approved budget. Also for the first time, um, and you might remember us mentioned this a couple months back, we uh, completed our, uh, for the first time, our popular annual financial report, which again is an effort by us to take a 200 page book um, of very exciting information and summarize that down to something that is uh, more easily understood by uh, a layperson. Um, and then the final thing I wanted to mention was, as you might remember, we, uh, you all approved uh, us to purchase new budget software um, that was implemented this year and used by us and all the departments. Um, and we've gotten a lot of good feedback from some of the departments. And um, I, we appreciate that uh, purchase. Looking at what we expect to accomplish um, for the next, for the coming year, um, we're going to continue to evaluate and implement new processes and technologies um, to help increase our efficiency in the finance department. Uh, specifically, this would include um, more electronic payments to our vendors. Uh, we're actually working on that now and expect the first phase of that to be implemented over the next month or so. Um, we're also going to be looking at um, the opportunity for uh, proposers to submit bids and proposals online as opposed to submitting paper documents to us um, when we have formal procurements that go out on the street. Um, we're also um, going to be looking at ways to improve the experience for our customers, our residents, in terms of when they have to make payments for taxes or utilities and to make it as easy for them as possible. Other items we expect to accomplish include implementing the new uh, floating homestead exemption that was approved by voters last November. We're in the process of that right now and um, have had contact with Fulton County as well as our financial software provider to make sure that's ready to go for the next billing cycle. Uh, we're also going to uh, work on developing some training programs for city employees to provide education on finance-related policies and procedures. Um, as you might imagine, and as you know, we have a lot of different policies, a lot of different procedures, and when we have turnover, it's hard to make sure that you know, everyone is on the same page in terms of what's expected and, and the proper procedure. So we actually began a pilot uh, of that this year, and we expect to continue that on um, into the coming year. And then finally, uh, we're going to continue to transition to a more paperless environment. Uh, really, over the last three or four years, we've been working on this. We've uh, transitioned a lot of the large items, like our contracts and things like that, that are now paperless and signed electronically. Um, so we're trying to get the last few uh, types of forms and things like that transitioned over, over to a paper, paperless environment. So looking at our FY 2020 proposed budget, um, 
our main general fund operating budget, as you can see, uh, for FY 2020 is proposed at a little over $3.2 million. Uh, that's a little over $100,000 increase from the previous year, about 3.4%. Um, the bulk of that increase is related to personnel adjustments being the merit increase that was approved in the prior year. Um, additionally, um, I also wanted to point out that we were able to uh, reduce our budget. This is incorporated into that. This is a net increase of $106,000, but we were able to decrease our budget by $47,000 in postage and printing through um, getting more and more residents to sign up for electronic billing. So the city saves money, and um, over the last few years, that number has grown to about 6,000 residents that receive e-bills per month. Uh, 6,000 residents that receive e-bills every month. Um, so we, we're realizing the savings of that over time. Uh, we also have the debt service fund. So this is the fund that uh, pays our annual debt service payments just for our general obligation bonds. Um, so it's a small change in that over the prior year. And then we have our auto rental excise tax fund, which as you can see um, in FY 2020 is proposed at $475,000. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. Um, our total positions are proposed to remain the same at 30 full-time positions. This is our personnel history over the last five years. And you can see it's remained pretty constant. We did um, add two new positions in FY 2018, um, but we're proposing to stay at 30. Our budget in FY 2020, as you can see, the bulk of our, our operating budget is devoted to personnel, uh, $2.5 million. Our operating budget covers some of our some of the major things in our operating budget include our outside audit, uh, the printing and postage of our utility bills, um, some of our cash main functions, and other such items like that. This gives you a five-year history of our general fund budget. And then, like I said, I also wanted to talk about our auto rental excise tax fund. Um, as you might remember, this was a uh, new excise tax that was approved and began uh, July 1st of 2018. Um, so we are expecting to collect about $250,000 annually from this tax. Uh, this is a 3% tax on all auto rentals in the city of Roswell. Um, in FY 2019, while the, the new tax started in FY 2019, we actually did not budget any expenditures for this fund in FY 2019. Um, and so for FY 2020, we are proposing to transfer um, all the funds available in this fund, $475,000. This would be the FY 19 uh, revenues we've received plus the FY 2020 expected. We're proposing to transfer all of that to the general fund. Uh, and as you can see, the little footnote here at the bottom, um, this would be used uh, for the purpose of promoting industry, trade, and commerce, which is one of the allowable uses for this tax. And this would be to help offset um, the cost of uh, the funding for Roswell. That's everything for the finance department budget. Um, any questions? Questions? Yes, council members. Uh, Thank you, Mayor. So, so. Leave the, the best for last. <laughs> so, um, so, on page 214. Oh, two, yeah, two, yeah, the auto rental, oh, two, I guess. Perfect, yes. So, you know, I may have a different idea of where this money should go, because the car rental means cars, and cars go on roads. So for me, you know, transportation is a perfect destination for these funds to help us to maintain, update, and upgrade the, our roads in Roswell. So um, there's something that we can discuss where, you know, makes more sense this auto rental excise tax goes. Well, um, actually, it's, it's accepted by, you know, could be used by state law? Or it actually couldn't. So state law, this kind of gives you an idea of what it can be used for. So state law specifies that it can be used to promote industry, trade, and commerce, and tourism, or it can be used for capital projects related to sports, conventions, rec facilities, or public safety facilities, or for the maintenance of those facilities. So state law is pretty specific in what it can be used for. 
So the roads won't be in, under any of those. Right. Okay. And in some ways, because we're transferring this to the general fund um, to offset the cost of Roswell Inc., you know, that frees up general fund dollars that can be used for other things like transportation, which were already included in the proposed budget. So. Okay. Additional questions? Anyone in the audience? Thank you, Mr. Lark. Thank you. The final thing that we wanted to uh, talk to you about today um, were, were the proposed fees that uh, we're going to be bringing forward and that we've been discussing over the last few months. Um, as you might remember, so uh, over the last few months, uh, we've talked to you all about some proposed fee increases. Um, we are recommending several of those as part of the FY 2020 budget process. Uh, most of these are related primarily or are due to um, increased operating costs, also as a way to continue um, funding the maintenance needs of some of our enterprise funds. Um, so looking at um, those potential fee increases, uh, we brought those up and talked to you about those at our five-year forecast work session as well as our revenues and fees work session. So based on all those discussions and the feedback we've uh, heard, uh, we, are, we have um, included that in the proposed budget. So the revenues that you do see for um, stormwater fund as well as our water fund and uh, the general fund re regarding community development fees all assume um, the approval of uh, these rate increases. And so we did want to go over these one more time with you, get any other feedback that you might have. Uh, the first one, as I mentioned, would be our stormwater fund rates. Um, these are divided into different tiers based on the amount of impervious surface. Uh, most Roswell residents fall in that second tier and pay $3.95 per month. Uh, we have around 25,000 customers, um, and we are proposing about a two, uh, proposing 2.5% rate increase uh, beginning in FY 2020 and going through FY 2024. This would allow the department to um, do about $1 million to $1.1 million of capital maintenance, um, maintenance capital on an annual basis. And so with a 2.5% increase, you can see uh, what those rates look like over the next five years. Next would be our water and sewer fund. Um, here we have a little over 5,000 customers. Uh, we're proposing a 2.5% rate increase starting in FY 2020, um, and then a 4% annually going through FY 2024. And again, uh, the primary reason here being um, addressing some of those increased operating costs as well as continuing to allow the department to complete the um, maintenance capital that's needed. So with a water fund, as uh, Mr. Skowski mentioned earlier, that would allow them to, to complete about $500,000 annually in water line replacements um, going forward. So now um, I'm going to turn it over to Lenore and she is going to uh, talk to you about the community development proposed fee increases. What I'm going to present to you this afternoon um, does include some information that was provided to you at a previous work session. Um, at that work session, there were some questions about seeing some comparisons between kind of total packages and some of those fees that we have um, in comparison to some of our neighbors. So I've got some additional information to share with you in this presentation that will cover that. Um, just as a quick update, um, the last time that we updated um, our rates and fees for community development was in 2012. Uh, we are looking to bring us um, a little bit more in line with um, industry practice. Um, we do have some changes in the code that have already happened um, that do require a little bit more staff time when it comes to review. And then we've got some regulations and some laws that are coming um, and expected to be signed by the governor any day now that will also further impact um, the need for additional staff time when it comes to managing um, our permit intake and review um, process. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the um, original things. This gives the changes only in our planning and zoning fees. This isn't a complete package. Um, in the handouts that you have in front of you, those larger sheets will give you all of the fees associated with the planning and zoning division. Um, these are just the ones that we're looking at making some minor changes to, mostly to have some administrative covering of our cost as well as um, for advertising. So just to kind of give you a comparison um, for rezoning, for example, for revisions, um, this would be a situation where a rezoning application has come in and been paid for 
And then because of changes that they want to make, not necessarily because of comments that the, the staff have made, um, or any um, uh, buddy in any of the commissions or, um, that would see the project through the process, but if they made a change to their plan and wanted to bring it to us, we wanted to be able to allow for um, some coverage of some of the staff time that would need to be done to review that. Um, as you can see, um, our neighbors tend to charge a little bit more um, than what we're proposing. Uh, we currently don't charge anything, so we are looking at charging $100, um, but our neighbors um, are, tend to be a little bit uh, more expensive for their revision costs. Um, for variances and concurrent, concurrent variances, um, we currently do not charge for the administrative level, um, so we're just really looking at an application fee of $25. Um, our neighbors um, will charge anywhere from $100 to $350 or even more uh, when, you, when you get over to the Sandy Springs area. Um, they have a flat rate for everything, no matter what kind you're coming in for, um, they charge you that. So it could be a very small administrative level, but they still charge you as if it's a full application. Um, for advertising, we currently do not charge anything. Um, we're really just looking at trying to cover those costs for getting the mailings out and putting the sign on site. Um, and the, our neighbors actually either have the applicant be responsible for doing all of that, um, or they charge them um, something pretty comparable to what we do now, a couple hundred dollars um, seems to be kind of um, the order of magnitude that most of our neighboring jurisdictions are charging. Again, for revisions, same thing as I discussed with the rezoning, um, we're looking at just the $100 to be able to cover some staff review time, um, and that's pretty much in, you know, the average of what you see with our neighbors, um, with Alpharetta being on the high end of things. When it comes to our plats, um, our final plats, um, right now we have a flat rate of $100, which really does not take into account the size of the project that may be coming in. Um, so we took a look at what some of the other jurisdictions do, and we kind of like the idea of having a flat rate and then doing also a per lot. That way we get a little bit more to be able to cover some of that staff time uh, when it's a larger development. Um, our other neighbors charge either nothing <laughs> or flat rates, um, with, with Alpharetta being on the higher end um, with what they charge. Um, the administrative division plat, um, just really looking to bump that up. We get a lot of these, and they can be very simple of splitting a property into two. The staff time that is spent getting those smaller projects through the system um, and through the process is pretty substantial because they're usually dealing with a property owner who has no idea what they're doing. They're missing all of the notes. The surveyor that they've hired doesn't understand our checklist. Um, and so we have a lot of back and forth. It's not just one set of comments and getting it back. It's explaining why they have to do things. And so we're just looking to try and cover some of those costs. Um, and same thing as um, with the other revisions, it's, um, or, or excuse me, the other numbers, it's pretty much in line with what our neighbors are charging. Continuing on with planning and zoning fees, for design review, this is specific to the administrative or what we formally refer to as minor um, applications. We currently do not charge for those. Um, again, just to have some sort of a coverage um, of the cost of putting those into the system, getting those read to our plan reviewers. Um, we're not looking at um, a huge cost, um, $50 for both the DRB or the HPC. Um, our neighbors either don't have this or Alfred is really the only one um, that does have any semblance of this. Um, they charge quite a bit more. Um, it's $200 and then if you're in the central business um, district, you add another $100 on top of that. Um, so there wasn't a lot to compare to with our neighbors. But again, not looking at a very big increase, just something to be able to have some coverage for um, the administrative time. Within the Metropolitan River, river Protection um, Act, the corridor that's the 2,000 feet to, to, um, along the river, we currently do not charge for this. And it is a substantial amount of coordination with our, the, the staff um, Atlanta Regional Commission that are responsible for this, as well as our internal staff for reviewing the projects that come through. Planning and zoning staff spend a lot of time looking at the numbers that are calculated um, in order to be in compliance with the law. And then the city engineer position is also required to be involved in review of the erosion control um, at the same time that application is coming through before it even gets to Atlanta Regional Commission and before council sees it. Um, so just looking at a flat rate of $200 for those applications um, to be able to cover that. And as you can see, the only other two that have um, this within their jurisdiction um, really are looking at covering public hearing fees for the most part. I'm not quite sure why they break it down that way, but then they also charge an extra amount per lot. Um, so if it's one house coming in, they've got a $250 fee. Um, if you've got a larger subdivision, then you're going to pay by the lot for that, for that review process. Um, and then um, I'm not exactly sure what the regulations call for. Um, I didn't get a chance to look this up. Um, what Sandy Springs refers to is that they're going to do flat rate for a lot, but then if it's a larger development, there's fees that ARC actually requires, and I guess what they're saying is they're going to double that. So right now, the ARC, that check goes straight to them. We don't see that. 
those fees would also be paid to Sandy Springs um, in their scenario, the way that they do that. And I'm not sure how it's calculated, but it's a lot of money. I do know that. <laughs> Any questions on the planning and zoning stuff before I move into engineering? I know I'm flying through this. All right, excellent. Um, what we had done on the land disturbance permits through engineering was we had broken down by single family residential and non single family. So I'm going to skip over to the comparisons because I feel like this is a much uh, more telling story, but all of that information is in the packet that was provided to you. So what I've got in front of you now is the top is a single family land disturbance permit um, that's coming in on a lot that's less than an acre, and then the second one is greater than an acre. So um, when it's less than an acre, what I have done, because our neighbors use different mechanisms for calculating the costs, is I have made an assumption that the estimated valuation for the construction of this project is $250,000. And that's because we've got jurisdictions who use valuation to determine the permit fees. So right now we charge $125 um, flat rate essentially, which includes application plan review and the actual permit cost um, for a single family parcel um, less than an acre. We're looking at adding um, an increase of $50 um, to cover plan review. So the plan review fee is actually what's increasing um, in this case. Um, and then, um, I believe that's what I did, <laughs> and, and the comparison is if you were to do a single family lot, new construction around $250,000 in estimated valuation, and our neighboring jurisdictions, Johns Creek, based on my going through their paperwork, charges over $18,000 for that permit. Now, they may have some negotiating power that is different from that, but if you pull out all their permits and you pull out all their information, and read it straight for face value. Those are the numbers that are calculating out because they do it based on valuation. Um, this threw me for a loop. I don't quite understand why their numbers, consistently you will see their numbers are excessively much higher. So I'm kind of discounting that. I don't feel like that's where we need to be. Uh, looking at the other jurisdictions, they tend to be charging anywhere from $500 to $700. We don't believe that we need to increase our fees by that much. Um, the, these tend to be easier applications to get through because they do tend to be on the smaller scale. Um, so that's why we're just looking at kind of a nominal increase in that. For those that are greater than an acre, the reason this is important is because we now have to make sure that they also have a permit from the state for the erosion control and there are additional fees that get added on to that by law that, because it's greater than an acre. Um, again, we're just looking at a minor change um, of a total of $100. Um, so today it would be the 325, and that's based on a 500. Uh, uh, it's a larger lot, so we're looking at a bigger house, um, and we actually are saying it's a five-acre parcel. We're going to one of our bigger parcels, you know, maybe over off a of Stroop Road. They're coming in for new construction, and so these numbers estimate what the, what we have to be paid because of the state permit, um, uh, as well as the way our grading permit um, is set up based on that. Um, and as you can see, um, the other jurisdictions are still basically charging the same. Their acreage doesn't seem to matter um, in the way that they calculate theirs. Any questions on that before I skip over? All right. So for the non-single family or commercial properties, this would also include um, um, properties, for example, like a townhome development. They are required to come in for a land disturbance permit for every one of their buildings. And so we classify that as a non-single family um, because it's multiple units in one application. Um, currently, for those that are less than an acre, we're charging $275, looking at increasing that to a total of $400. Um, and as you can see, our neighbors um, are pretty much a lot higher than that, especially when you get to Dunwoody and Sandy Springs. Again, they have theirs based on evaluation, um, and it's like $8 per 1,000 square feet or something like that, and it just happens to come up to a pretty high number. For those that are greater than an acre, what I've assumed in this particular case is, again, a five-acre parcel, but a million-dollar type commercial project. Um, our fees would be increasing pretty significantly, and that's because of the way that we're looking at changing the breakdown. And I'll go back up to this just so you can see this. Um, when we get to the larger projects, we're doing additional inspections and plan reviews for all the extra infrastructure. So it's not just a driveway and a house. Now we have stormwater pipes and roads and sidewalks and all the processes that are used to build all those things have to be inspected along the way. So there are per unit costs for curb and gutter, for the roadway, um, for striping, and then we get to stormwater, head walls, the different components of that that have special inspections or extra times that we're going out there to review those. And so we are looking at some increase in those costs. Um, the comparison spreadsheet that I gave you for engineering does show how those numbers that we're proposing to increase to compare to the other ones, 
Um, but that is why you are seeing such a significant difference for a non-single family property that's over an acre is because those costs are not coming into play. Um, so today on, let's say this is a five acre parcel with a cul-de-sac street about a thousand feet long, 10 lots, we would only be charging about $6,200 for that permit. If we go and increase some of those other fees that we've got for curb and gutter and sidewalk and other things that we're doing to make sure that they are building them correctly, that we're getting out there more often, um, then we'd be looking at a pretty significant jump, but it's still on par or significantly lower than our neighbors um, because of the way that we are calculating our fees. Any questions about that? Uh, is that uh, uh, fee or? Or just, in, yeah, I've got one more, one more, two more little sets I'm going to show you. Yes. Yeah, I might have to have a remedial lesson in this one because I'm very confused. Um, you don't, we don't have to do it now because everyone else seems to get it, but. Um, to go from six to thirty-two thousand seems. I totally understand. When you get a chance, if you look at the engineering application fees, page one of three, it has an orange column down the middle. It should yep. be about four pages in on the eleven by seventeen set. Um, when we get finished, I can show you. But you'll see down there. This is where the majority of those cost changes are happening. Because today, for example, and I won't go through all of them, but just to give you kind of a, an idea, um, for a stormwater pond, we're charging three cents a cubic foot to go out there, which gives me like, I don't know, 40 bucks <laughs> or something very small. It takes a lot more time. There's multiple layers to it. We're going out there multiple times. We're not only doing it when they first get started, we're making sure that the various components that go into the construction are being covered, and we also do as-built inspections on them as well to make sure that the as-built documents they provide to us are covering that. So. There's some changes in here where the numbers that we're currently charging are nominal compared to the effort that it takes to actually do the inspections, and we're trying to recapture that a little bit in what we're required to do uh, from an inspection perspective now and in the future. So that we can go through those numbers to kind of look at that, but that's where that change is coming in. All right. Tree removal is another one that I've got included into here. Um, we've spent a lot of time over the past couple of years talking about this. Um, the only change we're looking at doing in this particular case is really when it comes to plan review. Um, when we have situations where it is not clearly somebody who's exempt, for example, a single family property with a dead tree, it's very simple. It's a paper processing thing, so we're not looking at making a significant change, actually any changes to that. This is more for someone who's coming in, um, wants to remove 10 trees. They're all healthy. None of them are specimen necessarily, so a permit's required. But the amount of time that we've got to spend in confirming what they're doing, making sure that the plan is accurate, that they have the right information to prove that they're not specimen trees, um, is taking us a lot longer, and we have a lot more of them coming in. So that is the increase here, is for it, to add a plan review fee to cover um, the work that the Arborist is doing for processing the um, tree removal applications as they come in. Um, the top one is for a single family, assuming that there's no specimen, so you can see it goes from a 75 flat rate to $100. Um, this again is if they require a permit. If they are not, if they are exempt, if they are non-specimen trees, it's $25 and they're done. That doesn't change at all in this proposal. For a single family who is removing some specimen trees, so again, this is probably a much larger property. Um, they're looking at taking 10 trees down. Let's assume two of them are 20-inch oaks. Um, they are great and healthy, and they're just taking them down because they feel like it. <laughs> there's, not, there's not any other reason for taking them down. Um, maybe it's they're doing a big addition on the back of their house, and the trees just happen to be in the way. Um, today, they would be paying $3,675. Um, our increase is $100 for the plan review, so it goes up to $36. Or 37 25 um, our neighboring this is a place where you'll see a very big difference and that's because a lot of our neighbors don't calculate and require payment for specimen tree removal in many cases for example in Alpharetta you don't pay you are forced to plant um, and then with um, Johns Creek you just have to have their permission Evidently, they just don't care <laughs> and then for Milton and Sandy Springs they use a different um, uh, type of calculation they do it per tree or they do it by canopy and so the way that the costs um, break down is, is a little bit different now to make sure that I also am clear about this if a resident were to come in they want to take specimen trees down but they replant trees to compensate or what we call recompense for those trees the the specimen removal portion of this fee would go away and you're really only looking at about a hundred dollars 
So there's, there is that to be said. I wanted to make sure you were aware that this is what we can charge, but they, they actually have options. We allow for replanting by code instead in, in lieu of having to pay the fees. Um, and we encourage that because obviously we want our forest to maintain renewal. We want to keep having more trees planted. Um, and so it starts with you shall pay a fee or may pay a fee, um, but then it gives you the opportunity to be able to plant on site. And that's the same for residential and commercial properties. And so we have a balance. Sometimes they can plant everything. Sometimes it's a mixture. This is worst case scenario from a dollar perspective of what we could potentially see um, in those situations. For the non-single family, um, I've just kind of given one example here, assuming it's a five acre parcel like we've been using. Um, they've got 100 trees are taken down. Let's assume 10 of those are 20 inch oaks. Um, the, the size for that is a six um, on the scale for the DBH that we use um, that's included in the code. Um, I've given the 300 square foot canopy as an example uh, because we have other jurisdictions that actually use the canopy size and they charge by square foot of canopy potentially lost. Um, there's not a lot of change here. Um, actually, that looks like it's a typo. No, it is up, sorry. <laughs> it's just a small change for plan review. Again, the, spe this, the bulk of this cost is the specimen cost, assuming that they're removing those specimen trees. Um, but just to show a comparison that our, a lot of our neighbors do not assess those fees and, um, or even require replanting necessarily um, when it comes to the removal of trees within their jurisdiction. And then building fees. This is the last bit. I will go through it as quickly as I can. Um, single family new construction. Um, again, I'm using some similar models as I did for the land disturbance permit, assuming a $250,000 estimated valuation and 2,500 square foot house. Um, currently, we would be charging a little over $1,500. With the revision, which is really a simplification of our process, it's not a massive revision, and I'll go back and show you this in just a second. Um, but it's basically to take, instead of having five different scales we have a minor and then everything else is just a flat rate, whether it's residential or commercial, um, mostly because of the fact that it is very confusing for our residents and our contractors to come in and look at that fee sheet and go, okay, this is the cost of my project, I gotta pay this amount for this part and then for the rest of it, I divide it by this and charge by this and um, it is automatically calculated by, for us in the system, but for them to try and estimate their fees coming in, we get an awful lot of questions about it. Um, and so looking at some of other neighbors who do either a flat square footage rate or have something that's a much simpler scale. Um, we felt like it just was an easier thing for us and it doesn't make a drastic difference in the overall cost. Residential seems very little difference um, in, in the grand scheme of things. As a matter of fact, they might even see a cost reduction in some cases, um, whereas the commercial, it, it actually makes a little bit more of a difference. So um, it is approximately a 300 and some odd um, dollar increase. Um, when you were to, to do the switch that we're proposing with this, this scale. Um, but as you, can, as you can see, we're kind of in the middle with everybody. Um, this is one of the places where I think we might be a little bit above where some of the other jurisdictions are. Um, but with some of the changes that we've got coming online with um, the third party plan review, um, we're gonna need to make sure we have this stuff nailed down, whether we make any changes or not. Um, because we're required to publish all of that in a very clear and easily understood way um, to be in compliance with that law that the governor's just assigning today now. And then for, the, so what I've got here is that's new construction, so a brand new house in the top one. This bottom is somebody's doing a remodel. Let's say they've got an unfinished basement, 1,000 square feet, they want to put a rec room in there. Um, the cost actually goes down a little bit because of the way that I've changed the scale on the bottom. So you see a little bit of a cost savings with the smaller projects and the bigger projects are the ones where you tend to see a little bit of an increase. Excuse me, Jones, yes. Jones Creek numbers <laughs> correct? I know. Yeah, they do evaluate, it's by square footage. So they 40. don't have, again, this is me pulling out all their, their, go to their website, fill out an application, pull up their fee schedule. For new construction for a single family house, it's, 400, it's $40 a square foot. So it's 2,500 times 40, flat, that's it, no, Exactly. It boggles my mind. Wait till you see commercial. It's millions of dollars. <laughs> Something wrong. And it doesn't make any sense. So again, they may have other documentation that they haven't published that would change these numbers. But based on the tables um, that we have, and I have those copies of that in the backup of that if you do want to see that. Um, this is, so that's why there's a lot of times like, okay, they're there, but I'm not using that as a basis for what I think our number should be because I think they're completely out of, Orbit. They just make no sense to me. Thank you.
And then for commercial, again, you'll see, like, I mean, $5 million, really? I mean, <laughs> I don't understand why they're done this way. I don't know if they've got other stuff built into that, but um, looking at this bottom one to kind of start with, just to kind of see the, the extreme difference. Yes, ours is going up by quite a bit because of us doing this valuation that we're talking about. But with Johns Creek, it's by square footage. So I'm saying in this case, just let's say there's 100 unit apartments, it's 1,200 square feet each, it's $45 a square foot. And it just, it, I, was, I did it three times because I thought I maybe had a typo on my calculator when I did it. So um, again, I just kind of discount those. Um, I even think Sandy Springs at $162,000 with them, they also use a valuation process as well. Um, seems to be extreme. We're right in the middle of those, I think, with ours. Um, again, this is looking at, you know, brand new big projects um, in, in the grand scheme of things, a $24,000 permit fee is actually probably not that surprising to most of the developers who would be coming to Roswell to do business. And that is pretty much it. This is an estimate, and I will make sure that is very clear when I say estimate. We have no way of knowing what's actually going to come in. We could have a million decks and three apartment complexes. I mean, we, just, we don't have any way of knowing what will come in and when and what those valuations will be. And the valuations make a very big difference on the number going to be. So the way these were done, we worked with finance to come up with what have our revenues been that we've generated in the past, looked at some of the average percent increases that we're looking at kind of by category as opposed to trying to nitpick into the line items to come up with what we think is a reasonable estimation for what it may be. It could be more. We just don't have any way of knowing. So. Yes. Thank you. Um, so if I understand this correctly, and if I don't, um, if I make it part of my after school lesson, um, <laughs> I'm struggling with the magnitude of the increases on anything commercial. Okay. Um, you know, one of the things we know is that we need to work very hard to increase the tax base from commercial. And if we're discouraging anything by uh, having, you know, fees that are dramatically higher and thus increasing the cost of the, of the uh, project by a, a, a order of magnitude of, you know, what's pretty steep here, uh, or appears pretty steep, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about that. Okay. And, and it's... It's kind of looking at it as a whole, you know, by the time you add all the four or five different commercial fees, right, sure. and assume there's some trees too, um, you know, have we, have, are we going to discourage the very thing that, that, that we'd like to encourage from a commerce standpoint? So um, I guess uh, help, you know, in, my, in my after school uh, lesson, help me understand how that, you know, how, how we can how we can solve that problem, because that, that is a big concern for me, that we discourage the very thing that we want to encourage. Sure, absolutely. And, and a lot of, when you look at, especially on the land disturbance engineering side, those cost increases um, for the larger commercial projects um, are strictly related to what staff is supposed to be looking at in the field and the amount of time that's needed for that. And one thing that is, that is there's, a, there's a carryover of that moving in, and going forward with other inspections that happen either throughout construction or after construction um, that are also expected to be built into that. Um, but that's really where that's coming from. And then on the building side, um, I mean, if we look at, it's the, after you get to the engineering, there's a building application fee, um, and there's actually an orange kind of tan section that's in here. When you look at the percent increases there, it is very clear that the bigger projects are really seeing the increase right. is, is where that's happening. And so and we can certainly look at that. You know, trying to go to something that was simpler was what we felt made the most sense when we've gotten the feedback that we've heard from the applicants that are coming in. Um, and we certainly have some flexibility on how we do that. We based our initial assessment based on the valuations that we were seeing some of our neighbors charge um, for example, um, you know, when you look at the valuation, um, we did um, a, a flat rate for residential and then a different, more expensive flat rate for commercial. Um, you know, those could be the same, they could be equal. There, there's, a, there's all sorts of factors that you can put into that. And we're not sold on any one. This sure. was just a, the, based on what everybody else is doing, here's what we think makes sense. The other thing that might help me understand this a little bit better is if you were able to show me the portion of the $313,856 that comes from these commercial pieces in your calculation, in your estimates. Uh, if the number is smaller, 
right, then maybe I have a little less concern. But 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 again, that that would be my concern. Right. I, on those. I can certainly Thank you. And, and those, honestly, I have no way of knowing what that breakdown is from that total. Sure. Uh, because it literally was a percent applied to a number. But we can take a look specifically at you know, what we're looking at as our increases compared to what everybody else is doing um, in order to, to take a look at that. Thank you. Councilmember Spada. Thank you, Mayor. So, yeah, I mean, that is a the great point for the commercial, but also maybe we'll, it's going to be interesting to see it, you know, all the fees for commercial projects, all of them, compared with North Fulton cities, yep. to see if in every single one we are higher or lower, and then that bottom line, which is the what really matters, the bottom line, right. among all the fees for commercial mm -hmm. versus compared with all the fees for commercial for uh, North Fulton cities. Right, and that's actually provided in the packet that's in front of you. Maybe okay. summary will be more yeah. uh, well, visualized. <laughs> so the details of every line item is in the 11 by 17 handouts that are in front of you. All the planning and zoning engineering and building are included in there. And so there's right. the building proposal, and then there's a comp that compares with our neighbors that actually have something published that we can compare to. This was just coming up with a sample project that I applied to everybody to come up with those numbers. It was, I mean, this could be a completely, you know, off the wall project that I've created that would never happen and the numbers look off, but that's what we decided to do to be able to have some to present in response to the questions we had before of seeing how this would actually influence when it comes to the, the actual permit costs as a whole. But that is all provided in there and we can certainly, and we could go line by line. I wasn't gonna try and do that at this meeting. Right. Um, Please don't. No, no. For, you know, <laughs> then my, my comment is like, thank you know, thank you so much for bringing to the light all these fees for discussion and analysis. Um, you know, I don't have data, but I would like to know the direct correlation between the fees that all the cities in North Fulton charge versus the amount of development that they've been having for the last five years. Sure. So if. No, to see if this is a straight correlation, because if it's not a straight correlation, this means that we are totally leaving money on the table uh, on, on all these fees. If this is a straight correlation, then we can start a discussion to get more, you know, sharpen the pen. But if it's not, and it's not obvious a straight correlation, then uh, really we are, the only thing we're doing here uh, is leaving money on the table with all these fees, being so low on those fees. So uh, I think that are we going to have a more in-depth discussion about these fees uh, coming forward, or uh, we're going to talk about these fees during the budget process? Well, what I, is the? I'm not sure if we're having another. I, I could maybe bring it to the admin committee, which is when I was going to try and bring this. Um, since this is the second time we brought the data in front of you, I wasn't planning on it. Mm -hmm. But if we need to go through that, we can certainly do that. Um, and that's the only time I can think of will be at the next admin um, committee. Do you need approval from council or recommendation from council or nothing from council for these fees? I'm pretty sure I need approval from council. Oh, yeah. It will be a part of the fee resolution, correct? Right. Okay. Thank you. Great job and very Thank clear. You very welcome. Thank you. Any other questions? Is there anybody in the public that would like to comment? Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Luckett, did you have any closing remarks? Or? Yes. Just briefly, we want to talk about next steps. Um, we do have our first budget reading scheduled for uh, Monday, May 13th at 7 o'clock at the Mayor Council meeting. Um, our plan was to um, also have the e resolution ready for uh, presentation at that meeting as well. It would be a separate item. It doesn't require two readings, this is adopted by resolution. Um, and you know, if it makes sense, we could wait on the comp dev to a later date and take the other ones forward. Um, it's up to you all, but um, right now we are planning on having that ready for you on Monday, May 13th. We have our second budget reading on Tuesday, May 28th at the Mayor and Council meeting. Uh, similar to what we did last year, we are planning as of now to have our millage rate adoption process um, uh, kind of work later in the process, um, mainly because we haven't received any information yet from Fulton County, so we don't really know. We want to be sure um, that we have some at least some preliminary information um, before we move forward with our millage rate adoption process. So 
we will come to committee, kind of like we did last year, with once we have information, we'll come to committee with a recommended uh, rate to advertise. And um, based on consensus that we get from council, we'll move forward with that in the military adoption process. The other thing I wanted to mention was the ad delete process. Um, so, uh, kind of like last year, uh, we'll be compiling requests that the mayor and council have for any ads or deletes uh, to the proposed budget. If you can provide those to us, we'll compile that and we'll send it out regularly so that everybody gets an updated copy of what's been proposed. Um, that ad delete list will be presented at the first and second budget reading um, for consideration. Um, by the full mayor and council. Um, so that's all of our presentation. I'll be glad to answer any other questions you might have. Well, I've got a couple of things. One is I just want to remind any everybody that if you are going to add something, you do have to find a delete. <laughs> <laughs> you can't just add. <laughs> um, but also with the fee structure, this budget is based on adopting that fee structure. So we really can't vote on the budget until we agree on the fee structure, correct? And that was kind of the thinking behind bringing it to the first budget meeting was so that if there was some, a different direction the council wanted to go, we would have time to make adjustments in the proposed budget to accommodate those changes in revenues. I'm not completely sure that's true. I mean, we're voting on the budget and we don't know what Fulton County is sending us. And we're, you know, we're, we're, it, it's all, it's all sort of estimated at that point anyway. But more importantly, that's why I asked the question about, could you break down that three hundred eighty-three thousand dollars a little bit? Again, I understand it's just a model that Lenore has done, but it would be nice to, you know, if, if the things we have in question aren't big, maybe we can get through those quickly. Well, and what I'd suggest is that everybody do their homework. Please don't just wait until the first budget reading yes. to say, oh, what's this or. Oh, where did that go? So, if if you all would have a conversation with Ryan, I would appreciate it. And just to let you know, too, um, in regards to the community development proposed fee increases, all of Lenore showed about over four hundred thousand dollars in estimate. Uh, we only accounted for about two hundred thousand dollars in our revenue. So, Thank you. we're not counting on the full four hundred because we knew that was just kind of a best guess scenario. Um, but I did want to make that clear to you all. So. That helps a lot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions? Thank you all very much for your time. We are Thank adjourned. You Thank you. Good job, Ryan. Awesome.